Hello, welcome to London. Welcome, greetings from London, and uh, welcome to this talk about uh, about worldviews, narratives, and system change. And it's really uh, a talk about the problems of this world, which there are many. We won't, you know, go into them. There's climate change, you know, environmental, uh, ecological catastrophe, all those political problems. We're not gonna, we're not going to dwell on the problems. We're going to talk about solutions. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, solutions, which many thinkers and commentators have been kind of really uh, suggesting. But there's kind of like a blockage, a, a failure to completely articulate exactly what it is. And there's a reason for that blockage. We'll explain what it is. We're, we're going to, in, in this space of a couple of hours, we're going to really uh, make an attempt to, to, to really flesh out what many, many commentators and thinkers are saying anyway. But we're going to really make it really explicit in terms of, uh, you know, this idea of a missing narrative, missing worldview that can somehow remedy the problems of this world. Okay, so we're going to do it. Okay. Screen share, okay, just a screen share just to uh, just dive right in. We just cut straight to the chase. Okay, so problems of the world, screen share. So, so th th there's a kind of like a, a, a kind of agreement about what's going on in the world, a kind of what, exactly wh why, are, why, why the world's in such a mess. And it's to do with ideas. There's this idea that there's a <laughs> loss of narratives and a crisis of meaning that somehow if you could solve this problem, then all the other economic ecological problems will be solved. So, so let me go through the, the, the introductory part of the talk, just give you a kind of context of the rest of the talk. So, so for instance, Alan Greenspan, the former head of the uh, US Federal Reserve Bank in 2008, after the banking crisis said in 2008, his ideology, okay, his own words, no longer corresponded with reality. And that's why he, he was blindsided by the banking crisis. And his ideology is essentially Ayn Rand, okay, absolute selfishness as a virtue and neoliberalism. In fact, Alan Greenspan's a small world. He was, he was probably the only friend that Ayn Rand, or closest thing to a friend that Ayn Rand ever had, his closest acolyte. It's a small world, isn't it? And he became the head of the Federal Reserve Bank. Douglas Murray uh, on the conservative right, he has written recently in, in his book, Death of Europe, that Europe exists in a, in a state of existential tiredness, that somehow, uh, uh, quote, a feeling that perhaps the story has run out and a new one has, must be allowed to begin. But he doesn't know what a new story is. Okay, the uh, top selling Yuval Noah Harare, the old stories have collapsed and no new story has yet emerged to replace them. <clears throat> And Chris Hedges, who is always clamoring for revolution, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, uh, quotes, uh, well, he, he thinks that um, Antonio Gramsci, who's a hardcore Marxist theorist, he thinks this, this is a period of interregnum, which means that the old ideology has faded, has lost its power, and that no new kind of ideology has yet emerged to replace it. And Adam Curtis, who, who's a very uh, acclaimed uh, documentary maker, makes political documentaries, uh, he has a very wide, broad view of things, I, I think. And he, he says, this moment of transition from one big story to another. So, so you get it, there's a kind of collapse of meaning, the idea of a post-truth world, a world of fake news, fake facts, even fake science. So, so this is, uh, people believe that this is something to do with what's going on in the world and, and the problems we're facing. Okay, let's get the uh, next diagram, okay. So, so many commentators are saying that somehow there's a missing narrative and vision of the future. So back to Adam Curtis, he says, "What? okay, this is a splicing of many different quotes from his interviews and documentaries. He says, what is needed is a new story, a powerful vision of the future, of what an alternative future could be. Okay, so that, that's one, one view. Now, Slazhov Zizek, the philosopher, again, same thing, a lack of a vision for what we are striving for. And his, his pal, Frederick Jameson, who is a Marxist academic, he says what's needed is, quote, a vision of the future that grips the masses, but it's not, it's not there. And he laments the left's failure to address this utopian problem in any serious way, this kind of vision of the future. And Yuval Noah Harare has said, uh, quote, that uh, what strikes him the most is that nobody from the left nor the right can produce a serious, meaningful vision of, for where humanity will be in 2050. He goes on to say that tax takes into account climate change, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and all that, unquote. And okay, Jordan Peterson says that you shouldn't try to change things, but he's not sure that the present system can actually answer the really big questions. So we have a bit of a problem, don't we? Um, the, you know, Silicon Valley has this vision of a technological singularity that the advent of AI will solve everything. It's going to be all amazing and incredible. But there's a stumbling block. You know, that stumbling block is they can't create true artificial intelligence. And uh, the progress is really illusory that the people really who know what's going on, people like Elon Musk, Larry Page, according to Peter Field, they're losing interest 
because there's lack of, there's no real breakthrough, there's no real theories, there's no real new ideas in, in the world of artificial intelligence. Okay, so lack of a narrative and vision of the future, and more broadly, mm -hmm. this idea of a worldview. So worldview is the kind of the whole shebang, the sum total of ideas in the purpose person's head, including metaphysical and cosmological assumptions, and you can extrapolate to the societies. So worldview or Weltanschauung is, is a German <laughs> word. Okay. Now, now the, the history of the word Weltanschauung is, uh, is this notion that all knowledge should exist as an organic unity because it went with the idea that all reality, the universe also is an organic unity. Okay, now, now a lot of you be, might be thinking, but you know, these worldviews don't exist as organic unities. Well, that's the problem. We think that there is a way of organizing knowledge into an organic unity, and that's part of the solution we're talking about. And, and it's a really old idea. It's pre-Renaissance, it's pre-Socratics, pre-Pythagoras, it's ancient. And this idea that epistemology reflects reality, that there's a tree of the sciences somehow reflecting a cosmic or world tree. Yeah. It's a very old idea. Okay, I'm just gonna mute, uh, I'm just gonna mute, uh, can I ask you to mute all your uh, microphones? Okay, mute all, oh, okay, I just, just muted, muted all, okay, okay. and uh, you can switch on. So I, I just muted you all, you can switch on whenever you like. And, and it's the same idea in philosophy, in modern thinking of Willard Van Orman Quinn's knowledge web, Anthony Wallace, Wallace Mays ways, uh, sludge, sludge of Zizek's cognitive mapping, new ideological framework, the same kind of thing, this kind of whole constellation of ideas in a person's head and in reality. Okay. So related to worldview is this idea of uh, what's needed as a, as a revolution in mental conceptions, according to David Harvey, who's a left-wing scholar, and Ron Paul, libertarian, right, we need an intellectual revolution, or else the turning point will be driven by economic law. So you, you get the picture, something to do with worldview, narratives, revolution in mental conceptions, and at the bottom, we have a kind of old group of kind of new age theorists, uh, counterculture theorists who talk about a new operating system. They talk about worldview. Uh, Jeremy Lent talks about the worldview is the operating system. You need a kind of operating system reboot to solve the world's problems. Okay. Now, okay, now the really interesting thing, okay, this is really, really interesting, is that all these people who have been questing after this answer, they have all, even militant atheists, even atheist thinkers, have converged on solutions or suggesting solutions that are really bordering on the spiritual, not just bordering, I mean, going right into the religious mystical, and I'm talking atheists and hardcore militant atheists even. Now, this is unbelievable. This has happened in the past few years, and I can't believe my ears when I heard some of these things in the past couple of years. These people searching for answers to the really big problems in the world they've been coming to these really unusual conclusions and they all kind of point towards some kind of mystical, spiritual, mythic solution. Okay, let's, let's go through this because we're gonna, we think they're absolutely right. Okay, we think, and we're gonna fill in exactly what they're trying to say. Adam Curtis, the documentary maker, okay, quote, someone will find a way of fusing scientific ideas and religious ideas to produce a sort of vision of an extraordinary world that somehow has a logical power to it. He thinks this is the solution to the political, economic, social malaise. Jordan Peterson, he's already going down this, this kind of fusing of religion, science kind of uh, path, um, and uh, you know, science and clinical psychology. Now, now very interestingly, uh, people know that he's very into Carl Jung and mythic archetypes. He's been talking about this for years. But he's really going far down the rabbit hole because in a very recent interview from just a few months ago, he was basically talking to Carl Ruck, the uh, psychedelic uh, pioneer. And he, uh, he's really going down a rabbit hole because he's asked Carl Ruck specifically about Carl Jung's red book. Now, Carl Jung's red book is the book that his, his sons and daughters want, didn't want published. It was only published 50 years after his death in 2009. And in this red book, Carl Jung goes full Gnostic. He goes full awakening the God within. He's saying that this is my real message. This is what I've been trying to say, but I couldn't because of convention and you know, not losing my reputation. So, uh, so Jordan Peterson's really going down a rabbit hole and he's basically uh, asked Carl Rook about this red book with respect to his own knowledge. Now, uh, he really pressed Carl Rook on his uh, psychedelic explorations really pressed him and uh, you know Carl Rock was almost like denied he didn't want to answer he says oh no I don't want to talk about religious things I don't want anyway I'm a kind of like academic but he but then he was cornered and he told Peterson he told Peterson you okay quote you dummy there is no god you are god okay unquote now the fact that at the end of the interview he says to to uh, uh Carl Rock at the end of the interview says 
you are taking part in something of staggering importance. Okay, so it hasn't, so, okay, you can join the dots. Okay, I, okay, I, I get loads of flack from uh, Jordan Peterson fans when I make jokes about Jordan Peterson. I get loads of flack from people who like my ideas. They say, oh no, you shouldn't actually mention his horrible name. I mean, look, he's got good ideas, he's got bad ideas. Okay, so I, I think, <laughs> I, th I think he's, you know, talks, says a lot of sensible things and he talks a lot of rubbish. Okay, so that's, that's, that's my view, but he's going down a rabbit hole. He's, he's saying, you know, he's basically arriving at this kind of mystical, spiritual viewpoint and he's actually bringing it to a right wing mainstream telegraph, you know, kind of audience, which is great. Now, this is unbelievable. Sam Harris, the most militant of militant atheists, took five grams of magic mushrooms in uh, April of 2020, actually beginning of the uh, COVID lockdowns, maybe that's something to do with it. And uh, this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not making this up, go to his YouTube channel, Sam's Mushroom Trip. Uh, you know, look, this is incredible. After his experience, he says, quote, we need a modern way of reinstating the mysteries of Eleusis. Not an atheist, uh, you know, kind of advocating for the return of an ancient institute whose sole main purpose was to, you know, unify with God. Amazing, incredible. You may or may not know that this is the case. He just, just knows that psychedelic drugs were taken in Eleusis. Okay, so <laughs> amazing. And then he goes on to say, with respect to this, resurrecting the Institute of Eleusis. Now, this is absolutely incredible. He actually says, look, quote, so that we can create an ethics and a politics and a culture, culture generally that has its priorities straight. Now, oh my God, some, um, you know, some uh, Sam Harris fanboys will just be up in arms and like, what are you doing, Sam? You traitor, you know, but Sam, fantastic. This is great. This is fantastic. This is well, well done. And then, you know, we can go on. Uh, Douglas Murray, there's a real a sea change recently. Douglas Murray has now been thinking, the, he's, a, he's a new atheist. He's saying that, oh no, the atheist worldview doesn't do sanctity of human life. Oh no, we, we, we've kind of thrown the bar baby out of the bathwater. And he, and he thinks he, he's calls himself a Christian atheist because he thinks there's something in the teachings of Christ that's, that, that's needed, that, that's kind of missing in society now. Richard Dawkins, uh, he, he, in, in, in a fairly recent interview, he talked about the nastiness of the selfish gene. And, and he said, because of this, he is a passionate anti-Darwinist. I'll say that again, because you thought you misheard me. He said, Richard Dawkins says he's a passionate anti-Darwinist when it comes to applying the ideas of selfish genes to living our lives and organizing society. Because he says it will lead to a, a Thatcherite, he was joking, Thatcherite world, i.e. neoliberal world. And uh, he basically, now he's kind of like saying that maybe um, getting rid of religion is not such a good thing after all, because what might take its place will be something far worse. These, these are recent interviews in the past couple of years. There's a real sea change going on. Uh, generally, atheist thinkers like, uh, like um, John Gray, atheist philosopher, he's, he's recognizing that ideas like progress came from religion. It came from ideas of prophecies, essentially. That's, that's what he wrote in, in his book, uh, as he mentions in a few of his books. And uh, this, this idea that somehow left liberal values come from religion, even though there's this kind of liberal disdain often for religion, is being recognized as almost Nietzsche is being re revisited, who exactly warned of this. Once you get rid of religion, and especially uh, this hidden religion we're going to be talking about, you kind of undermine the foundations of your morality and your ethics. And a, a recent, uh, well, actually not recent, a few years ago, an article in the, the Humanity Journal. Okay, the article was, uh, the title was Dignity, the Last Bastion of Liberalism. Okay, it was a re review of four books that tried to establish human dignity on kind of philosophic grounds, logical arguments, legalistic arguments, and the reviewer came to the conclusion that they really were getting nowhere. They were just, it just didn't work, okay? What it means is that the last bastion of liberalism, when you take away the religious aspect, it has no bastion. We could say the same for equality, you know, universal sisterhood, brotherhood, a whole list of liberal kind of, you know, kind of values, progressive values that have really uh, lost their kind of base. Now, Slazhov Zizek, the um, kind of, uh, I, I guess he, he calls himself an atheist, uh, uh, atheist Hegelian. Now, it's not widely known, I mean, that, uh, okay, uh, okay, it is fairly widely known that uh, Marxism is, is essentially derived from the, the entire Hegelian framework. It's not so widely known that the Hegelian framework is essentially what it is, okay, the entire Hegelian framework is essentially 
esoteric or hermetic Christianity in philosophic language. Now, this is not, uh, this is a fact. This is not my opinion. Entire books have written about it. In fact, I read a recent book about uh, Austrian economics, which is quite right wing neoliberal. Um, they use this fact to, criti to critique Marxism. So the fact that you have this kind of atheist uh, philosopher calling himself an atheist Hegelian is really like another return to see this esoteric hidden hermetic religion. Do you see? There's a kind of repeating pattern going on here, isn't there? And uh, we, we can, okay, second slide is a continuation of this idea that we can, we can mention a whole list of uh, new age uh, counterculture thinkers. Jeremy Lent, Charles Eisenstein, J Jamie Wheel, we mentioned earlier. It's all kind of constellation of ideas of, you know, this new worldview operating system has to have something to do with Eastern, indigenous wisdom, Taoism, bit of Buddhism, maybe Advaita Vedanta, bit of psychedelics, need a bit of religious experience, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the picture. Now, Jamie Wheel, okay, he's gone right down the rabbit hole. He's, he's been advocating psychedelic use and he writes books on peak experiences. Now, this is, uh, now he knows in a sense the truth. He knows because from you know, the, his manner, it looks like he's always coming down off drugs when he's being interviewed. Okay, so he's basically, <laughs> he's gone right down the rabbit hole. He knows the truth. He knows about this uh, kind of non-duality thing. But then he, he goes on to say, he's an anthropologist. He goes on to say, quote, this information needs to be articulated in a way that someone somewhere can use it to reboot a functional culture. He goes on to say, we need metaphysics to make sense of the ineffable and ethics. So again, this idea that there is this kind of truth, this kind of like almost a like holy grail, and we have to bring the grail back to Camelot. You have to basically somehow unpack it. And I think this is exactly what we're going to explain. That it unpacks into narratives and worldview. Russell Brand, he's like a UK's very own uh, kind of revolutionary. Okay, he's a, he's a comedian, uh, former drug addict. He's quite you know movie star who writes books about politics, always advocating about a revolution now. And he says, we need a spiritual revolution again, inclusive spiritual ideology, new mythic, art, new mythic narrative, but he doesn't quite know how to do it. He, he did a MSc one year, a degree at SOAS on politics and religion in order to find you know, insight, but you know, maybe, maybe uh, that's not the best place to, to go in, in a kind of traditional institute to find that kind of insight. George Monbiot is another kind of UK revolutionary. He comes always kind of, you know, kind of, kind of trying to instigate, trying to ferment revolution. He says, we need a grand narrative, the, the restoration narrative, he calls it. He, know, he says, we need an overarching narrative framework embedding values and principles. Quote, we should also be able to list our principles to name them. Now he's another atheist thinker. And uh, in an interview, the interviewer said, isn't your restoration narrative, isn't that the mythic archetype? Isn't that Joseph Campbell's work? He, he kind of says, yeah, I sort of read his books and maybe I didn't read his books and no, I can't, I can't actually talk about it. But anyway, look, the restoration narrative he recognizes comes from religions that do have apocalypse, that do have past revolutionary movements. But what's missing is what is being restored. And, and we're gonna argue that what's needed to be restored is this kind of missing hidden factor which is the basis of your values and principles. Unless you restore this missing factor, then you really can't ground your values and your principles. There's no way of doing it, you know, referring to some of the early ideas ever. And just to finish this kind of introduction to set the context of what we're going to talk about, the, the tech world, and, and uh, I call this the new idolatry, okay? They think they're starting new religion, but it's like a new 21st century idolatry. Yuval Noah Harari has this idea of datism, that somehow data and, and algorithms will be the new focus of meaning and that, that data and algorithms will be as religion. And there's also this idea championed by many people actually, uh, many of these new kind of cults or sects out there, these kind of, kind of like uh, new age sects, that the internet is a new God. And this idea of simulation theory that people like Elon Musk believe in, it's essentially mysticism for nerds, that we're living in a lose reality. It's essentially Maya Sanyata for nerds, basically, but they're putting it on materialistic grounds. So you're living in a computer simulation. The answer, you know, question is, what simulates the simulator? Then what simulates that? It's turtles all the way down. So basically, we, I think there's a better way, you know, better interpretation we can give this, this kind of like new idolatry of the tech world. And this idea of transhumanism making people godlike. Well, you know, becoming godlike is really from the corpus mexican, but they weren't talking about power as in temporal power just for the sake of power to be godlike. They were talking about spiritual transcendence. I would say that basically the, these ideas, new ideas of internet as God, it's really the new idolatry. It's really a new golden calf. Okay, the internet is a very big golden calf, admittedly, 
it's huge compared to you know kind of like what like I see in the movies the, the Moses movies you know and it contains loads and loads of gold I mean the, the world internet you know electronic components contains tons and tons of gold but it's still a golden calf okay so that we think that there is a, a kind of way of addressing all these problems and issues and ideas reaching out towards something transcendent, something spiritual, something mystical, something religious. We, I, I, I think that there's a way of basically bringing it all together uh, to uh, you know, answer essentially everything, all the issues we've talked about in the first um, uh, kind of 15 minutes of this talk. So I, I think basically there is a kind of unifying uh, worldview and narrative which actually essentially answers every single issue and question we've talked about so far okay so okay let, let's go straight to it okay so basically what is that missing narrative okay I, i'm going to tell you the most uh, fundamental narrative in the universe is it really is the most fundamental narrative of them all okay it's the most in, important story I, I, of them all okay i'll tell you what it is okay back to screen share okay back to screen share okay back to screen share now, now this story really is i mean it is the story of of all stories it is basically the the most incredible story and most important story in the universe it really is okay um okay um this uh story is, is really it's, it's fractal it's basically like a template and it's basically it, it, it kind of manifests it kind of manifests itself all over the place now this uh this story is really quite uh, something uh, something you're totally familiar with Okay, let, let me explain. Let me explain this story on familiar terms. Okay, let me explain the story. Now, um, okay, <laughs> this is this is the human life cycle. This diagram represents the human life cycle. Okay, and uh, so, so okay, it starts with the family home. Okay, so, so this is this is the story, the family home, and uh, you should, so you're like you're like a child, and basically you're in your family home. And then you enter your teens and adolescence. It's a kind of disturbance of your peace. You have this ideal world. I mean, my, my, my family home was, was secure. We live in the same house in the same two houses from age uh, free to, to leaving home for university. Very stable you know, family. And, you know, so very, very happy. Had all the toys I wanted, had friends. I was popular in school. It was really nice. But there's this kind of disturbance in the force when you get to your teens. You really kind of like become a teenager. You start like looking at girls. You start thinking, we well, start obsessively thinking about sex. And you start thinking about wider things. The toys are no longer so satisfactory. You start reflecting about people and, and, your, and your parents. And uh, when, when I entered my teens, my loving father, my mother and father became like, in my mind, they became like really like, but underachievers, underachieving losers. That teenagers like this, aren't they? And uh, you know, it's really bad. I know. And uh, but I didn't realize that my my, my father and mother had a real adventure. You know, to get to, to produce the life I enjoyed. Uh, you know, in a kind of fairly prosperous industrial society. Uh, something about my my father who died uh, uh, fairly recently. Um, you know, he, he's telling me this, these stories. Okay, this, this is a real adventure for Hong Kong. Immigrant, immigrating in the 50s, he got on a boat. Okay, what an adventure, a boat. And he told a story of uh, the boat would stop in these places. He says he's, he's stopped in places like India and he met all these Sikhs. He said that he said they, they were scary because they all had knives, but they were really polite. And then there was another port of call and there was another port of call. And then, and then these people were really diverse and maybe these people were once, once so polite, maybe these. But in my mind now, looking back on my dad's adventure, it, it's not like a Odysseus's voyage from port to port. I mean, you know, living with all these people, it must have been like the, the, the kind of cantina in Moss Eisley. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm getting at is they, they had their myth, little journey to produce my life, okay. And then, okay, so my life as a teenager, okay, I, I just couldn't wait to leave home and I left home. Okay, so I went to university and had this really quite uh, turbulent life. I mean, you know, I really, my twenties really were quite turbulent. I'm mean, really kind of like a, deviated from the norm. You know, I, I wanted to do a PhD uh, research in artificial intelligence. And I realized it, it was all rubbish. I mean, the, and I was right. You know, all the kind of research, you know, neural networks, you know, support vector machines, expert systems, it's basically all dustbin of history now. And, and really uh, there is this kind of like leaving, leaving home and there's kind of like a adventure in the kind of like dark underbelly of London. And then this kind of venture to become like, I guess, I guess sexually mature, to be adequate, to, to find a partner. And you find your partner and basically you, you set up home together and, and there's kind of like marriage or sexual union. And this is kind of honeymoon period and you set up home and you basically you know, find a job, you bring an income 
And you basically, uh, you have kids and then you're in this kind of domestic child rearing situation. And you're back to the beginning of the cycle. Now, my daughter, my eldest daughter is 12, just about to en enter her teenage years. And, you know, she's becoming a teenager, self-absorbed, always on a mobile phone, and probably thinking to complete the cycle that daddy is such, such an underachieving loser. <laughs> okay, I hope not. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, uh, I, I suspect that is the case. Okay, so that, that, that's life. Okay. Now, that, that's the human life cycle, and it goes on and on. It goes, you know, basically generations after generations. That, that's a kind of repeating cycle. Okay, repeating cycle. Now, uh, the... The, the cosmic cycle we kind of covered in, 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 in uh, the talk in November. So we're going to skip through that just to make sure we get all the political material in. Now, there's this notion of a, a kind of like um, a kind of myth cycle. This is uh, Joseph Campbell's monomyth. OK, so this is a kind of like distillation of all the mythic stories of, 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 of in the world, OK, all through history. And you know the story because it's the story of Star Wars and it's the story of Dune. It's the story of Lord of the Rings. The story is so, you know, so captures the imagination that all these kind of epic best-selling books and movies, they all derive from this basic framework. It's also the story of prophecies in world religion. Okay, so, so what is that story? This basic story really is uh, the most fundamental, powerful story of them all. Okay, basically, there is a village or palace, and all is tranquil, like, like your, your childhood, always tranquil. And something disturbs that tranquil. There's some kind of messenger or some kind of RTD2 says, you know, help me, Obi Wan, help me, Luke Skywalker. And there's this call to adventure. And you kind of leave your kind of homestead, your kind of stability, and you have to go into the world. You enter this kind of dark forest, this kind of like you know, night sea journey, kind of my, my dad maybe getting on the boat and seeing all these strange people, Moss Isley Cantina. And you, you, there was all these trials and battles. And uh, there's a kind of, at the end of it, there's, a, what, there's this achieving of the grail. Okay, the, it's represented by the princess, it's often represented as sexual union. So back to the first diagram. And it's the process of illumination. Now, now, Joseph Campbell says that in every single myth, the real meaning of this grail, this illumination, is a mystical experience. He calls it, he calls it the experience of the, the mythic hero, experiences being the, 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 the circle whose center is everywhere, whose circumference is, is nowhere. It's like the all in all, experiences unity with Godhead. So it's a mystical experience. And furthermore, Joseph Campbell uses the same in a very convincing way to, to describe the, the this life cycle and the journey of the founders of religion in exactly the same way. And here, the uh, process of illumination is Jesus's 40 nights and days in the desert, his mystical experience. It is Muhammad's night journey, is Mah uh, Buddha under the Bodhi tree. And then there's this return journey back to Camelot, or the uh, philosopher king comes from the cave and then let's lead society toward the good. And somehow this apotheosis this journey this grail has to be shared with camelot and then somehow this grail this holy grail restores camelot back to this kind of sedate peaceful state the chaos and calamity which kind of like uh, generates the call to adventure is redeemed and somehow this grail this knowledge this this mystical spiritual truth is somehow key to restoring camelot and then the cycle begins again we think that this uh, story is not, we, we think it's not just, um, we, it's not just myth, it's not just, you know, fairy tale. The Roman um, philosopher Seleucius said that myths are things which never happen, but they always are. So Star Wars never happened in, in any galaxy, in any part of the, you know, any part of the universe. The, the monsters and Odysseus, they don't really exist, but the myths communicate truths which are transcendent, but these transcendent truths are real, but then these transcendent truths as a template, they do manifest in reality. And we believe this mythic archetype is exactly manifesting on a planet now. Okay, we'll, we'll, go, to this, we'll go through this in the second part of the talk. Now, okay, now this, this sounds all very theoretical. It sounds all very theoretical. We're gonna, we're gonna show it's actually historical fact in a minute. Uh, going back to um, the, the, this list diagram. Now, in all, in all cases, this, this uh, kind of mythic narrative, you, you can see there's a utopian vision, there's a happy ending. So referring to the earlier diagrams, this idea that what's missing is the kind of utopian vision, a failure to imagine utopia, a failure to, to imagine an alternative future. In, in the human life cycle, there is a hope of getting, finding your perfect partner, a hope of you know, uh, basically as a teenager, losing your virginity. It's basically, you know, this fundamentals of life. 
And then the cosmic, uh, the myth cycle, there is a hope that Camelot will be saved and basically all will be, all will be well. Okay, now if you're of the kind of, um, you know, kind of left-wing persuasion, then you might uh, consider um, this idea that uh, the dialectic, which is from Hegel and uh, Johann Gottlieb Fick, so it's a very powerful idea. And I mean dialectic, not in the kind of like, uh, you know, um, I'll stop the screen share for a bit to, so I can, uh, I can basically um, wave my hands about a bit. Okay, look, look dialectic means, uh, conspiracy theorists say that dialectic means uh, problem solution, solution reaction, reaction. That's a very, very common understanding. But where it came from is German idealist philosophy. And it's from Hegel and uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, the, these uh, very prominent uh, German philosophers. Now, um, the idea is basically there is a thesis. Okay, this is the, the, the existing state. And something is, not right, something is not right with that state. It becomes unstable. It's kind of falling apart. And out comes the antithesis. And the antithesis kind of wrestles with the thesis. And out comes the synthesis. And the synthesis becomes a new thesis. And then the cycle begins again. Now, it's basically, you separate the word Camelot for thesis, Camelot for disarray, for that kind of disturbance. And mythic quest hero of this cosmic battle restores Camelot. Essentially, dialectic is essentially the same as the mythic cycle. If we continue with Hegel, then Hegel is saying that eventually this dialectic process will lead to this absolute perfection, this absolute revelation, essentially a kind of spiritual revelation at the end of, of time. Okay, so it's really the same idea. Okay, back to screen share. Um, okay, screen share. Okay, back to screen share. And okay, no, no, pro prophecies, it's the same template again. Okay, Seleucius, these things never happened, but always are. They happened in the past. So Joseph Campbell collated all these stories. But the same story is the same story in world prophecy in the Zoroastrian, Christian, Muslim, uh, you know, even, uh, even Buddhist, even Hindu prophecies, uh, Judaic prophecies, they all talk about the same storyline. And it's all on a global scale. So it's basically the same template that's happened in the past with you know, kind of past founders of religion, but all these prophecies are saying, it's basically saying it's gonna happen on a global scale. Book of Revelation, which is about the future, really. It, uh, you know, the word earth is used 60 times. The word world is used eight times. The expression whole world is used four times. So it's about global events. And, you know, Muslim prophecies, the same as so Aston prophecies, all talk about a kind of global happening. Okay, so essentially the mythic archetype manifested on a global scale. Okay, now, okay. In all these cases, going to point four, there's a hidden factor. So we, we talked about the grail, this is transcendent hidden factor. And then the prophecies, th there's this idea of apocalypse, that, um, which means literally in Greek, the unveiling of the hidden thing. The, this is hidden factor becomes revealed, you see. And, and in Hegel's dialectic at the end, there's this kind of revolution, revelation of a truth to do with God at the end of time. So, so in all these storylines, there's a kind of hidden factor, a great goal, which is somehow revealed at the end of this process. Okay, we think this hidden factor is exactly what is uh, missing in, in uh, basically what the earlier thinkers were talking about. Okay, so all the, all the earlier thinkers we mentioned, uh, going back to these two slides, where they're kind of converging on this kind of mystical idea, even militant atheist, atheist thinkers are converging to this mystical spiritual idea. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Okay, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It is, it's like a baby. It's like a, like a proverbial baby that keeps getting thrown out with the bathwater. And this, this factor really enables civilization. Why does it, why does it keep, keep getting lost? Because this factor is hidden. It couldn't be spoken. Now, historically, historically, you were killed if you believed in this factor. If you spoke about it openly, you were, you, were, you were dead, basically. This is in the Gospels, this is in Corpus Mescum. It's a historical fact, okay, in, in Islam. And also, let me explain. This hidden factor, historically, um, basically, it couldn't be explained. It couldn't be articulated. It couldn't be, be spoken of in parables. So, in, in, in a sense, okay, one, you're going to get killed if you, you know, talk about it. But you can't talk about it because it defies logic. Now, let me give an example. Let me give an analogy. Aristarchus, the Greek philosopher, knew that it was, a, it was kind of like they knew that the uh, sun was at the center of the solar system 2,000 years before Copernicus. Okay, he, he's working in Alexandria. It, it baffled even Plato and Aristotle, you know, actually, it baffled even you know, Aristotle and Plato. They didn't know. It took, it took Copernicus 2,000 years after Aristarchus to basically reveal that truth. 
actually in early manuscripts of uh, Copernicus's work, he actually mentions Aristarchus's name, but then he's kind of like scrubbed out. So it's kind of like, you know, people have egos and he doesn't want to say, you know, just basically stole this guy's ideas. Okay, uh, uh, the, the point is basically truths exist, which can't be explained. What we, what, we, what, we, what we argue is basically that this truth has really enabled, it has enabled basically civilization. It keeps getting lost. But what I think is the case now for the 21st century, finally, finally, this truth can absolutely perfectly be explained. Okay, so we think this is what's, what's happening in the world today. So we think basically that, uh, you, you know, you know this, this truth that basically um, couldn't be explained in the past can now be fully, fully revealed. And, and we, we kind of dealt with this in the, um, in, in the talk in November. So if you type into YouTube, you type science and the full resurrection of the core truths of religion for the 21st century, then you will find it or go to my YouTube channel. L let me give you a summary. What, let me give you a summary of this, what's happened. Okay, so this is it. All through history, of, all through the history of science, there's, there's always existed parallels between uh, kind of uh, religion and science. These kind of like, like little parallels that have always existed. Like, like uh, and then what, what I show in that video, and I, I can't do the talk again because it's about two hours to explain. What has happened is that all these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle through very recent discoveries that have happened in the past five, 10, 20 years, all these pieces of, of these scientific jigsaw puzzle pieces can be fitted together to form a picture of the universe, completely scientific, completely rational, a picture of the universe that is identical to the, this hidden esoteric perennial wisdom. And okay, we go on in the, the talk in November to explain how it also shows the ultimate idea that God is one, we are one, but somehow the oneness that God is and the oneness we are is one and the same, I non-duality. And as we kind of, you know, kind of hinted earlier, this is the key psychedelic experience. This is the meaning of the esoteric religion. This is the meaning of Kabbalah, Tantra. It is the heart of all world religion. It's what Hegel believed. It's the heart of hermetic Christianity. It is what the Renaissance was all about. Okay, so, so that is what I think has happened in recent years, um, basically, which completely changes the game. So if all these thinkers are saying, basically the answer has to do with to the world's problems, to something alluding to this hidden religion, then what's happened now is basically we can completely fill in what these uh, uh, thinkers are alluding to in a very, very complete way. Uh, we're, at the end of the talk, we're, we're gonna explain something that's gonna absolutely seal the deal. Okay, so what I explained in November is powerful. It's enough to basically get the process rolling, but I'll, I'll explain something which will really seal the deal. So, okay, so th that's the hidden factor and that's the grail. It's gonna return for the 21st century. Now, what's the new world view going down the point of this diagram? So the new world view is essentially this. The new world view is the reform of all knowledge given this new assumption. So basically this new assumption was unknown, but now, now that this uh, kind of, uh, this, this assumption is fully revealed, it's literally like an apocalypse, the unveiling of the hidden thing then we can use this new knowledge then to reform all knowledge and it's really to regain the assumptions of the renaissance and the enlightenment do, do, do you get it it's basically is reinstantiating that which gave rise to the modern world anyway so it basically is a return of the original knowledge okay the new world view uh, then is a process of you know basically the reformation of all knowledge now now one plus one is still still equals two you know logic critical analysis, debate, peer review doesn't go out of style. But what you do is basically you use this, what, what is being, what's happening, you're replacing the assumptions on which your reasoning is based. And there is your intellectual revolution. There is your revolution in mental conceptions. It's almost like a return to Hegel. There's your kind of like, you always Marxist thinkers saying, uh, we need this revolution in mental conception. There, it's right there. And there's your return to Hegel. Now, okay, let me explain. Okay, point five is really important. It shows the, the relationship between this hidden factor, the, the new world view that we can use to system change and really uh, transform the world and return things to um, how they should be and how what the original intention of the uh, kind of uh, Renaissance thinkers had in mind and what the narrative is. Okay, so, so this, this is the relationship. Okay, the hidden factor unpacks the world view. It's the reform of all knowledge given hidden factor. But then the hidden factor, this new worldview contains the narrative. The hidden factor justifies the narrative. It's, it puts it on a kind of firm ground. It makes it objective fact. But then in turn, the narrative 
contains the hidden factor because narrative myth cycle contains the finding of the hidden factor. You see, now that, that sounds like a circular argument, doesn't it? Okay, you've got a circular argument that kind of bootstraps itself into existence, but isn't that a negative thing? It's a circular argument. No, 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 because the hidden factor is directly experienced. The hidden factor is basically based on the only certainty you can possibly have, which is your one consciousness, which is basically you know, following from Kant and Descartes. That's anything you know, you know, I think therefore I am. So this entire worldview, the narrative, has its foundations in the only certainty, and the proof of this worldview is the experience of non-duality. So back to Eleusius, back to you know, basically what these uh, even militant atheist thinkers are talking about anyway, it goes back to that central core truth of religion. Okay, okay. now, now um, to flesh out details, I won't, I won't kind of theoretically flesh out details, I'm going to show you that basically what I'm talking about is historical fact. Because what I've so far explained is it's world history. Okay, I'm not going to you know hypothetically flesh out this worldview or uh, kind of narrative, because basically it has happened. Okay, it's happened. Now we go to the uh, go to the Renaissance. Okay, once we have this uh, idea of this worldview hidden factor and narrative in place, we can totally understand the Renaissance in a way that's not taught in university, but it's actually true. Once we put this hidden factor into place, we basically have a view of the Renaissance, which is complete, which is, is compelling and can be used for political ends. Now, uh, this is not a new view of mine, okay? This is not new, idea. this basically, the, the, what I'm about to tell you has been explored by academics like, like um, um, you know, uh, Francis Yates, okay? Francis Yates and people like Paolo Rossi in Italy. Now, what's so special about them? What's special about them is they had a special remit to explore these kind of things because she worked in the, the Warburg Institute, which had its own endowment. The, the, the remit was to explore the impact of Renaissance on European culture. Now, if you uh, presented this view of the Renaissance I'm about to explain to you, you you're going to basically destroy your academic career. Okay, you're basically going to, you know, in, in a in humanities departments dominated by postmodernists and atheists, you're going to basically ruin your academic career. That's the reason why it takes uh, people like Francis Yates and uh, complete, you know, oddballs like myself to <laughs> explain this idea to you. So let me explain this very compelling view of the Renaissance, which is totally true. Okay, look, the Renaissance is this. This is the story. Okay, this is sound utterly familiar. This is the story of the Renaissance. It was a very dark time. It was pestilence. It was war. It was so dark. It was called the Dark Ages. And there was a searching, searching for an answer, searching for the truth. And, uh, you know, the, the Medici in, in Florence, in, uh, in, in Italy, they were basically, they were searching for this truth and they thought they found it. They found it in this book called the Corpus Medicum, which contained this idea, this central mystical idea. They found it in a monastery in Bulgaria. And this was the, this was the prize. It contained the Prisca Theologia, the truth of religion. And they brought it back to Florence and they translated it. And this is the epicenter of the Renaissance. Okay, the uh, internet connection is unstable, but you can still see me, can't you? You can still see me and I'm, I'm, I'm clear. Is, is that right? Nod your heads. Okay, great, great, great. Um, th so they returned this hidden factor in, in the form of the uh, Corpus Semeticum, and they basically returned it to uh, Florence. And then this uh, kind of knowledge uh, basically uh, it was, was translated. The Medici said, stop the translations of everything else. This is what the action, this is the Corpus Semeticum. This is the, the truth, the original kind of mystic truth of Egypt. This is the truth of God. Okay, so the hidden factor has returned. You see, the grail has returned to Florence and it led to the reform of all knowledge. This is not, you know, this is not speculating. This was the, the oration on the dignity of man, the manifesto of the Renaissance, was a reform of all knowledge and a kind of challenge to reform all knowledge. Um, Giordano Bruno writes about it in his Italian writings, according to Italian historian um, Paolo Rossi. So I'll take his word for it because I don't read, read Italian. It's, 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 it's part of the three-point Rosicrucian manifesto, the reform of all knowledge. And Francis Bacon, the English Renaissance, called it the great insaturation, so reform of all knowledge. You see, it's a fact. This is what the Renaissance was about. And it's about increasing knowledge through science. It's about you know, empiricism, kind of like learning about the world, because the knowledge of the world was considered as knowledge of God. Okay, And the increasing of knowledge, this idea of total knowledge, is right there in those kind of um, Renaissance texts to accumulate all knowledge. Okay, point three. The idea was that this knowledge should be communicated. It wasn't, kind of, it wasn't supposed to be hidden in monasteries. And obviously we had the Gutenberg press, which enabled this. And we had what's called the encyclopedia movement. Now we, we take encyclopedias for, for granted, don't we? So, so what encyclopedias, there's encyclopedias on my shelf. There was actually a movement to list all this total knowledge in book form and then transmit it into the people. 
which led to this idea, associated idea of pan-sophism, all things to be taught to all people. It was a movement. Um, Paolo Rossi, the historian, uh, says that in 17th century England, uh, Amos Comenius and his pan-sophism was one of the critical factors in the unfolding of the English Renaissance, along with Bacon and the Royal Society. So it was really important. All things to be taught to all people, this transmission of this knowledge, at least this idea of Bildung. Now, Bildung means to shape an image of God. That's what it originally meant. And it really meant education, it meant continuous education. A recent book called The Nordic Secret has really revived the idea of Bildung, but they kind of put it in secular terms. They kind of taken out the kind of religious aspect. So they, they, they and also the authors, I mean, I contacted them. So I, I get an idea what, what they are thinking. They, they don't really understand uh, Freemasonry. They think Freemasonry was a, a kind of adult kind of like meeting club, um, you know, to a, a kind of self-development club. And they kind of dismiss that, they, they dismiss the esoteric aspect. They say it was basically just a projection of kind of pre-scientific people. I think, I think Asleem like, I mean, I know lots of Freemasons. I'm not one myself, but I know lots of them. It's not the case. Anyway, this Bildung was basically personal education. It was basically using this pan-sophism to basically develop your knowledge in this kind of, you know, this kind of essentially spiritual knowledge to gain this knowledge of the world, essentially, uh, you know, basically uh, to learn all this kind of total knowledge. And it, so it's, it's, really, it's really a communication process, okay, that happened in Europe. Now, okay, this is really important for uh, people interested in system change. Okay, so point four in this diagram, okay, now, there's this, this idea of a secret revolution in the zeitgeist, which happened during the Renaissance. Now, this comes from Hegel, the philosopher, and we think he's completely right. We think it is exactly the communication of this knowledge, which was the secret revolution in the zeitgeist. Okay. Now, he called this a uh, secret revolution, a revolution in, uh, uh, he called it a spiritual revolution. It, it, it's, it's really a revolution in, in, in worldview. It's a revolution of ideas. Now, he, he wrote that basically people were astonished about the, uh, regarding the kind of physical revolution that took place. The kind of like, you know, the kind of like uh, storming of the Bastille, the kind of like all these kind of like uh, French, American, English Civil War revolutions, because they were unaware of the secret revolution that had taken place. And we think the secret revolution is exactly the transmission of these ideas, because these ideas weren't just about, uh, you know, nature and science, they were about politics. They were about uh, who we are, They're about this idea that somehow you are essentially divine. Okay, so really kind of mind blowing ideas. But these ideas also contained a utopian vision. In Oration in the Dignity of Man, there's this idea that basically there is a cosmic commonwealth and somehow society needs to be modeled on that cosmic commonwealth. It's a very old idea that somehow um, Vi will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The, the idea of rebuilding the Temple of Solomon, that basically, you know, there's, there's a kind of like, a, a, it was the holy ground that somehow all society should become as the, the Temple of Solomon. It, it's the idea of uh, the kind of like the philosopher king leaving the cave of illusions, returning back to society to return to, to um, lead society towards the good. So it was a utopian vision. And this really gave rise to a kind of almost like industry of producing books about utopia. Of course, Thomas More's Utopia. Then there was uh, the most probably most famous and influential um, Francis Bacon's um, New Atlantis, um, in which really uh, gave rise to the um, the Royal Society of Science. And then we can mention uh, the, you know, Christianapolis, uh, Campanella's uh, City of the Sun. We can go on. But these ideas of utopia really uh, stimulated, okay, point seven, political revolution, because basically in order to implement this, these ideas of utopia, you had to abolish monarchy. To, idea, to implement ideas of progress, equality, meritocracy, equal dignity, you had to basically depose kings and queens. Okay, so it led to revolution. And uh, it led to, uh, this political revolution wasn't just to uh, kind of like uh, establish new politics. It was also Concordia Mundi, Mundi a kind of, a kind of a spiritual harmony of humankind. It was also about universal brotherhood and sisterhood. So it's really about kind of shaping society into kind of more cohesive whole. And there's also a technological utopia. Basically, uh, these books like New Atlantis and Christianapolis, they really describe the implementation of technology to create this, te uh, this utopia. In, in New Atlantis, the key passage is basically the, the, the end of our foundation, the House of Salomon, on which the Royal Society is based, the key passage is, the end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes and the secret motions of things, and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. So total power. 
But that affecting of all things possible was really uh, another quote from uh, Francis Bacon. It, it was to uh, produce a progeny of spring of invention, i.e. technology, to overcome to an extent and subdue our needs and our miseries. And another point of the three point Rosicrucian manifesto, the idea of the panacea, the cure for all illness and malady. Again, this idea of creating a better society and using utopia to better our lives. And uh, New Atlantis and Christianapolis, they're really technological fictions. They really describe in quite detail how societies manage in a kind of technological way. The last point of this diagram, it wasn't just that, it was a spiritual redemption of humankind. That what they were really after was basically taking humanity to the state before the fall. So it's not just about material needs satisfied. They had a really ambitious agenda to take humanity to the state before the fall. Okay, so, so that in a nutshell is the kind of hidden band, a kind of like interpretation of the Renaissance because it's revolutionary. You don't get taught this in school because it basically kind of inspires people to overthrow governments and, and kings and queens, okay. Now, 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 let's just, before we take a break for a quick Q&A session, let, let's quickly go over the story of Islam because it's identical almost, almost down to the T, okay. The story of Islam, basically before that, it was, it was chaos, there was war, the Arabs were fighting each other. There's basically, it was, it was internecine warfare, endless warfare. And there was a, a desire, a search for peace and a search for solutions. And uh, they knew that there was a message out there and they were expecting a messenger. And this is not widely known, but Muhammad was one of those people who was searching for this message, this messenger that should have appeared at that time, they were predicting it. And then Muhammad you know, came to the realization, oh, it's, oh, it's me, I'm the messenger. But what came back is the batin, okay, the hidden, teach, hidden teachings of Muhammad and the Quran and the Hadith. Now, central of the Hadith, again, uh, and the, the batin is this idea um, in Islam, it's, it's called wadat al-wujud, which means the essential oneness of all, all things. We can roll off, you know, endless quotes from the Quran, from the Hadith, you know, Muhammad saying, man is my mystery, I'm his mystery, for I'm he himself, he is I myself. This idea that, that somehow we are one, of one soul, that somehow God is one, the oneness that we are, and the oneness that God is one and the same. So that's the central idea that returned in Islam. So like the Corpus Metacan, the central idea in the Corpus Metacan in the Renaissance. And, and from this knowledge, point two, basically ilm, which means knowledge, and ijtihad, which means critical analysis and independent thinking. Now, now I know, you know, I know like Sam Harris fans will be thinking, but why hasn't Sam told us all this stuff? You know, because it was banned, it was banned. Okay, Islam, the original Islam had this idea of ijtihad, critical analysis and independent thinking. No kind of like stone unturned. You could basically critically analyze and independently think about anything, especially religion. That is the original Islam. And from this uh, ijtihad and critical analysis and accumulation of knowledge, um, you know, like sayings from Muhammad, uh, whoever leaves his house each day in search of knowledge is walking in the way of God. The ink of a scholar is holier than the blood of a martyr. Do you, you get it? Knowledge in Islam was really, really important. And the accumulation of knowledge and basically the idea of total knowledge is found in Islam. The idea that Muhammad said all knowledge existing now is, is but two letters of 27 letters of the alphabet. And it's predicted that the other 25 letters will appear. So again, the idea of total knowledge and accumulating knowledge to get to these 27 letters, complete. And okay, so like the Renaissance, th this knowledge was to be communicated. Okay, they didn't have the Gutenberg press, but had public libraries. And uh, it is said that the libraries of Toledo and Cordoba in southern Spain basically contain more books. Each of them contain more books than all of Europe. So when the Spanish took Toledo in 1085 and uh, Cordoba in 1236, it really, it's like the pre-Renaissance, it really seeded the universities like Paris, Oxford and Cambridge. It really basically uh, kind of enabled basically what happened in Europe later. But in, in Islam, basically these libraries were basically accessible to everyone. So like, like the idea of, of pan-Sophism, all things to be taught all people, we have the idea of all knowledge accessible to all people, like pan-Sophism. And this idea of the most excellent jihad, Muhammad said, as being the perfection of character is exactly as bildung, the shape and image of God, because you understand Islam is this kind of spiritual process. And uh, Islam is a secret revolution because it's a revolution in the kind of thoughts and it's essentially is, is a spiritual movement basically. So there's no, nothing mysterious about here. It, it's, a it's a secret revolution in ideas that was transmitted that led to what's called the lesser jihad, um, which is basically the overthrow of the political religious elites of Mecca at that time. 
And that is uh, kind of like uh, the revolution that happened in, in Islam. But then it led to the greater jihad, which, the, is the, which is interpreted to mean to build a better society. And it was a utopian vision again. It was a utopian vision, a new politics of progress, equality, meritocracy. Now, I know some people think, but, but isn't Islam retrogressive? Well, well, no, because when Muhammad came, basically, uh, he, 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 gave, um, he basically gave women divorce rights and property rights. You got to understand uh, the Arab world in sixth, seventh century AD was very, very backward. Divorce rights, rights, property rights was progress. Okay, that was progress. It wasn't. He didn't make things like Sweden today. Basically, uh, you know, it, it was progress. What happened was that the process was stalled. Okay, so when uh, you know, kind of fundamentalists say, let's take things back to the time of Muhammad. Okay. They don't understand that that is a retrogress, but the original mission of Muhammad in a short lifespan uh, that he lived and did his thing was actually progressive. And if it continued, then it would have progressed to something far, far better. But it, it was stalled. Something went wrong. We're going to explain that in a minute. It was the same thing that went wrong with the Renaissance. We can go on. OK, universal brotherhood, OK, technological advance. But OK, didn't have the kind of technological explosion that happened in Europe. But it was uh, you're going to use that ilan to basically make life better. So they did take you know, knowledge from China. Uh, so the medieval Europeans were very impressed by toilet paper, by, you know, kind of like all this technology that, uh, you know, came from China and in, in the kind of Muslim world, essentially. So there was a technological aspect. And it really was about this kind of spiritual fulfillment of humankind. Now, what went wrong? Okay, what went wrong? This is really important because it allows us to explain and also rectify uh, if the, in a sense, if we understand what went wrong with the Renaissance, and what went wrong with Islam, we can then correct and take things to their natural conclusion. And it might well be the case. Now, Douglas Murray says that, uh, you know, Europe needs a new story, but maybe that story is identical for the story that Islam needs, that maybe Islam is also in a state of existential crisis. So, so to see these parallels, we, we explain what went wrong, then it becomes crystal clear. What went wrong was basically uh, in Europe, okay, basically the revolutions happened. Okay, this explains the meaning of left wing, right wing. The left wing comes in this idea, and right wing, of this idea of the French king. So the Estates General, okay, the, the, the parliament of the kind of like, um, before, before the revolution. Here sat the king, the, the French king, to, to the right of the king, okay, sat the first and second estates, the kind of like the clergy, and then the knights, aristocrat, aristocrats and the nobles, etc. Now, to the left of the, of the king sat the third estate, which is all the kind of like, uh, you know, you're kind of like a bourgeoisie, your paupers, your up and coming, those which basically enabled the revolution to happen. So that's your left wing, revolutionary left. Okay, what went wrong is basically, yes, the revolution has happened. But what went wrong, especially in the 19th century, was basically the truth was lost, it was forgotten. Now, uh, people recognize that the Enlightenment really eroded the truths of religion, attacked established religion. You know, Voltaire saying, man will never be free until the last king has been strangled with the, with the entrails of the last priest. Now, people get the wrong idea that these Enlightenment thinkers were against religion. No, they're against established outer mysteries of religion. They don't understand people like Stephen Pinker, all these modern thinkers, that these uh, Enlightenment thinkers were deeply religious, but they weren't so into the Catholic Church or the Church of England. They were into this corpus hermeticum hidden religion. And most of these protagonists in these revolutions were Freemasons. Do you get it? Freemasonry is the vehicle which transmitted this corpus hermeticum Rosicrucian knowledge into Europe. So, so, so see, um, what happened was the, the kind of like uh, atheism of the 19th century didn't just cut down the foundations of established religion. It also chopped the very roots of the Renaissance, of liberalism, of the Enlightenment values themselves. And that's exactly the problem we have today. This is what Nietzsche anticipated. This is why we have this kind of crisis in meaning. Okay. Now, in, in Islam, a similar thing happened in that the Batin were given to Ali, uh, Muhammad's uh, kind of son-in-law and, and cousin and closest companion. Now, um, Muhammad said, okay, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gate. Okay, and so the, the idea is basically the batin, the mysteries of Islam were given to Ali. Now the trouble is there, there was a kind of problem of succession. So the Shiites, okay, Shiite Sunni, this is the meaning of Shia Sunni division. It's, it's actually, it actually has parallels to left and right wing. 
the, 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 the Shiites, okay, it comes from a term which means the party of Ali. They were the political affiliates of Ali. Now, Sufism, which is another branch of uh, mystical Islam, every single Sufi order, about a dozen, apart from the Naqshbandi, they traced their lineage from Ali. So Ali is this kind of like mystical center of mystical knowledge. Now, the, 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 the thing about Islam, there was a succession problem. Ali but didn't become caliph. And when he did, he was assassinated soon after. So, and then things went really pear-shaped and then there's the Umayyad dynasty, there's Yazid the first, and you know, all Muslims, Sunni and Shia recognized it, it, this was a corrupt dynasty. They did horrible things. So things went pear-shaped very, very quickly, very, very early on. And we have the kind of like a grandson of Muhammad, Hussein, the son of Ali, who was slaughtered on the plains of Karbala. And that was the kind of last hope. So what happened was essentially that the Batin were basically suppressed. The original truth of Islam was basically essentially snuffed out. The Shia became the underdogs. The Sufis went into hiding. And uh, over the centuries, uh, in the 10th century, the notion of ilim remained, but the notion of ijtihad was banned in the 10th century. Critical analysis, independent thinking was banned in the 10th century. And also later on, the, the notion of wada al-wujud, these kind of doctrines of oneness, uh, metaf metaphysical oneness and the notion of fana, which means annihilation of the self in God, okay, which means essentially uh, this kind of mystical transcendent experience, they were banned. And then what we have then is what the situation we have in Islam today. The, the common pattern of the Renaissance is basically of a truth lost. And if this truth can be regained for the 21st century, we can revive not just Europe, we can revive Europe and Islam together and the rest of the world. Okay, I don't have the time in this talk to go over China, India, but this is the same story. Okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna, um, before I go into, you know, kind of, before I go forwards in time and, and show how the resurrection of this idea is gonna revive Islam, Renaissance, ideas of Europe in a kind of way that, and also USA in a kind of convergent way. Um, I'm just, we're just gonna uh, check the time and take a quick, uh, Q and A session. Okay, excellent. We're doing. We're not doing. Not bad for time. Excellent. This is, I've not gone on for for ages. Okay, I've managed to squeeze it in pretty pretty well. Okay, excellent. Um, in which case, um, if there's any questions, you can uh, unmute yourselves to ask a question if you like. Hey, why? Why? Sorry. Oliver, no, no, it sounds fine. It sounds good to me. Okay, <laughs> yeah, question. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, good to see you. Um, all this talk of uh, Cordoba um, is, is making me want to. Uh, what was that? <laughs> making me want to uh, explore my uh, my Moorish roots, which. Uh, oh, right, right. Yeah, my dad's is uh, is Moorish in the family, so yeah, it's interesting. I've been to Cordoba; it's a wonderful uh, cathedral there, where there's this real mixture of um, uh, uh, Muslim and and Christian art, like the cathedral, is a bit of a, a bit of a sort of mashup of the two. Yeah, um, but my question is: um, so you mentioned uh, the met, the meta modern guys, you know, Hansi, or Freinet, or the Nordic the Nordic secret, or the, oh, yeah, the, right. the Nordic uh, ideology, which is, yeah, which yeah. is I've been really interested in actually, um, and it's interesting you mentioned them. Like, I wonder if something from their from their piece about um, Meta modern communication. If you're familiar with their, their work, I, I hear that you are sort of um, wanting to sort of distance from it. But the idea of of, of, of communicating in in a meta modern way, and I wonder if we now now that we've gone through post post modernity, um, you know, uh, I know we've got Gail Bradbrook on the on the call, so uh, she'll she'll be following this. But um, oh yeah, there's, there's some real uh, revolutionaries. I, I see some real yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a yeah, revolutionary crowd. I mean, gosh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> great. Do you, do you think we need to? Um, do you think we need to relate to this to this truth in a in a in a new, updated way, like in a in a meta modern way? And by that, you can take from Hansi Freinach the idea of sincere irony. You know, there's the, like this sort of it's the new sincerity, but we hold it with an ironic sort of style and. I was wondering, just in, you say that this is difficult to talk about in academic circles, yeah, yeah. but it's because we've got that postmodern kind of culture. And do you think that we can talk about it more easily with a, with that meta modern kind of post uh, meta modern twist on it? That sincere irony. You know, John Bavaki talks about yeah, religion, yeah. not a religion. 
Well, 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 Oliver, I wouldn't say it's one way. I think I think when you're trying to create a movement that can actually, you know, communicate to the entire world, I, I wouldn't say there's one or I, I say just use every single effective method you can possibly have to communicate these kind of things. I, I would say. Um, what, what I would also add, I mean, so I don't I didn't mean to criticize the meta modernism crowd, but what, what, what I'm really about is uh, simplifying things. So I think there's kind of layers and layers of ism in this world you know, kind of accumulated over the decades, over the centuries. And I think what the world needs is a real simplification, I think. So instead of adding another layer of ism, I think the idea is basically really take things back to the, the basics. And we kind of like launching in a kind of reform of religion, you can really make things anew. So I think there's a kind of like a, there's a real assessment of basically all the facts and, uh, you know, HD had ne will never go out of style, you know, critical analysis, it, it could be banned, it can be suppressed. But I think it's really uh, just to apply the most kind of rigorous uh, critical analysis and then really the, the kind of like, you know, the most parsimonious simplifying of all things and reducing things to the to simplest. And that, that's my uh, not uh, argument against, you know, metamodernism and all those kind of business. It's just basically, I guess it's my approach which might clash with some of the thinkers in, in the area. But it's, it's all valid. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to start a new religion. I'm just throwing ideas out there, really. Okay. And it's amazing about your uh, Cordoba roots. It means you're, you're descended from, uh, you got your Arab genes, basically, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you, you're basically Umayyad dynasty. Now, and, uh, sorry, I, I know uh, I said negative things about Umayyad dynasty. It, it started off cropped. I mean, basically, they, they went to, uh, you know, um, North Africa, Spain, and they really were, they created something really quite enlightened in southern Spain, I think, for many centuries. Yeah, so, I'm looking to it more. Okay, any, any other, maybe a, a couple more questions and then we just move on just to uh, get all the kind of like, uh, just get the main points of this talking. Maybe a couple more questions and then we'll move on. Uh, hey, this is uh, Matt, uh, I have a question. Hey Matt, hi. Can you hi. hear me? Oh, hi, yes, I can hear you, yes. Uh, hey there, so um, my question is uh, the idea that everyone is God is a powerful idea, but it does seem, there does seem to be some mental roadblocks uh, with it that immediately come up. I think one of the, the idea, uh, the idea of God that people have is that God is like this all powerful being that can basically do anything, essentially yeah, yeah. Like the most powerful superhero. Uh, so I think it's something that a reaction that people actually is like, well, you know, if I'm God, then, you know, why am I not, you know, surfing the multiverse or something? Why am I kind of stuck in this fleshy mech suit walking around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, I, I got a, I got a, uh, I got a good, uh, I, got, I got a fairly good answer to this. I, I think, I think in terms of starting, um, you know, social movements or intellectual movements, I think basically it's like, like layers of an onion, okay? Basically, you've got the central truth, which is very, actually really quite verified and very few people will get it. So, so I think um, I think basically the outer layers of the onion are the outer mysteries. There always be this kind of like you know separation between the core truth, which is very recondite. Now, now Hegel said that um, the, the, he said that basically when a society is at a certain level of bildung or you know intellectual development, that they're ready for new ideas about God. Now he could have been wrong about the late late, late uh, 18th 19th century because this you know European society went quite atheistic. But what I think now is that in in this epoch now is that um, things are ripe for these ideas to appear and the fact that even militant atheists, atheist thinkers are converging upon this idea suggests that, that there is a kind of wide uh, kind of um, you know uh, kind of base that can really uh, absorb these ideas. We don't for social movements we don't really have to uh, explain to everyone uh, the core truth uh, you know this idea of the 3.5% to uh, cause uh, kind of system change and a 25% to uh, really shift public opinion. But I think, I think the time is right that we can shift enough people and get enough people to believe the core truth. And there's only gonna be a tiny minority that you need. Uh, th these are gonna be your fanatics and your zealots that you need to really start this kind of like intellectual social movement, to, uh, get the ball rolling. Uh, th there's this idea which I keep using, which is the spectrum of belief. Okay, so basically you have this core idea of non-duality, ad al wujud, everyone is God, or you know, total oneness, absolute monism, which is a very hard idea to totally grasp because it's totally it sounds wacky and completely insane. Okay, 
But, but what you have is a spectrum of beliefs. So you, you accommodate all the other beliefs. It's like, you know, in a sense, the world is flat. We know the world is round, but on our day-to-day -day lives, we can actually live as if the world is flat. Okay, it's just like an assumption, isn't it? And uh, so I think that basically when we're actually talking about we're not, you know, it's not about like we're not trying to start a cult or a religion. Basically, it is, it is a, it is a, a kind of intellectual worldview, and the worldview will contain the ultimate as the kind of like foundation, the absolute on which all the other kind of uh, seemingly relative facts kind of constellate around this absolute. But uh, it, it accommodates this, the complete spectrum of belief. What it doesn't accommodate is obviously you know, one plus one equals three. It doesn't accommodate intolerance. It doesn't, doesn't accommodate absolutism. You know, my truth is right. No other truth is, 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 is right in comparison. So I, th I think is, is that, is, that's the kind of best answer I can give you, really, that not everyone's going to get it. But I think the core truth is that you can communicate it and then give people a ladder, a kind of like, almost like new parables or new kind of ways to maybe not totally get it, but maybe get a little glimpse. Does that kind of answer your question, Matt? Uh, Wayne, well, can I, I ask you something? Sorry, maybe. afterwards. Oh, 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 let me just go. Uh, well, I guess a better, a better uh, observation would be that uh, the idea that everyone's God uh, kind of has to let, like address, I guess you could say the problem of evil, meaning, you know, how, how are you gonna communicate this idea to people if they reject it like well you know you know the materialistic uh worldview that everyone is just you know a bunch of uh like evolved apes and stuff that you know that's much more accurate if we were like all god you know we would be like you know you know in some different dimension you know building like castles for ourselves or something like that so so i, I think there's like a there's like an understanding gap uh with the idea that everyone's God. So I was, I was really asking if there's any uh, explanation to like why, you know, you, you know, if everyone's God, then why do bad things happen essentially? Oh, oh yeah, I mean, we, we, we kind of covered that more in the, in the last talk. I mean, I mean, it, it's the idea that once you have this kind of like, uh, you know, absolute truth, it's not, you know, like uh, all the other kind of like polar opposite truths disappears. Basically, it's almost like, you know, you know, when you navigate through life, you have to. You have this idea that okay, your rational mind on one level understands that it's non-duality. That you know, it's, it's all what our you know, unity of all being. We have to navigate life, and, and you have to deal with lots of different people. So, so I think this is idea of this, you know, this idea of this golden mean that basically you know it is idea of unity, oneness, and also at the other extreme, you know, kind of like ten billion zillion souls in the universe. And I think it's both. I think basically when you navigate through life, it, it's both. And in terms of the question of good and evil, yes, I mean in life there is both good and evil. But when you understand, it's basically one same consciousness and soul really, you know, inflicting suffering, bearing all existence, all evil and all good. Then I think there's a kind of rational view, but obviously uh, it's hard for most people to grasp. But you need to give people, I guess, outer mysteries to help them, you know, get through their daily lives. I, I guess. Okay, can, can, I guess. Uh, uh, is it was it a question, Gail? Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for the Gail. Talk. Absolutely honoured, <laughs> real <laughs> revolutionary, in, 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 in fantastic. I'm really, you know, admiring what your actions and what you're doing from afar. No. Honoured honor that you're uh, with us. <laughs> oh, really fascinated and always love for hearing you talk. Uh, love, so it's great, it's great to be here. Um, I was uh, I messaged you actually, wondered if you've been reading uh, The Matter With Things, uh, Ema Gilchrist's new double tome that follows on from um, The Master and His Emissary. He's basically looking at um, the two hemispheres, the two brains that we have in our heads. And the difference between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and that uh, Jill Balty Taylor who had a stroke of insight has put out an interesting video about the four people that we have in our head oh, and, I, and, I, and I, I just haven't got my head around something yet is, is the sort of operating system that we're running at the minute always seems like you know very extractive very dominating so you know success to success mechanism baked in you get some materials of some type and you yeah. use that to get more and um, it's my, my, my understanding at the minute, or, or always up for a different perspective, is that, um, you know, the right brain, the sort of more connected spiritual oneness brain is supposed yeah. to give information to the left brain and say, OK, you know, it, it, you can use all your sort of godlike powers of reductionism and, and science, but you need to use them in these really honourable and beautiful ways. 
and and it sort of brings me back to thinking about the sort of sociopath or whatever the person who perhaps is like very left brain thinks they're god and yeah, wants, yeah, yeah, yeah. And wants to be in charge right and tell everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. else what to do from that sort of wounded left brain perspective literally to the point of that each each time when we try and have these revolutions it, 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 it's it, or, or of some type or other it seems to me that somebody just comes along and fucking kills us you know I mean like <laughs> you know literally I mean like the, you know you can you, you sort of all the it's all about the oneness and the love and the beauty and the agency and justice and then yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. just comes along and takes a gun to you either literally or metaphorically because they're in the sort of left brain domination and yeah, I was yeah. thinking like how do we how do we you know paradigm shift to me is you you have to absorb that domination paradigm yeah, into yeah, something yeah. else right and yeah. how does it hold that how does it hold the sociopath I mean how does it hold the god the person who thinks they're god and thinks they can kill people as a result okay, okay. The, 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 the first thing I'd say basically okay firstly um this knowledge produced we, we kind of didn't last it produces what what um, Pika Mirandola described as black magic and white magic. So knowledge that you are God and eternal, okay, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a good guy. So especially, I mean, I know loads of psychedelic shaman in my journey in the kind of psychedelic underworld, and they were complete assholes. Okay, I'm not saying I'm any better, but I'm saying, <laughs> but I'm saying the, the, the knowledge that you are God, and they fully knew it. They fully knew from their direct experiences. It created very powerful people, very charismatic, powerful people. But it didn't necessarily do good things. I'm not saying I'm any better, but I'm saying it's empowering. And how it plays out depends on that person's uh, kind of, you know, their background, but how they integrate that knowledge. Now, another trouble with the left brain, okay, as you say, the language brain, the rational brain, is that there's been a disconnect over history with this experience and with reason. So, okay, okay, people took it as a kind of faith that somehow Jesus, these prophets were saying something true and it was up to their persuasion and charismatic powers to convince these people that they, they were right. And these groups like Freemasonry, you just respected that these you know, Freemason uh, you know, leaders were somehow directing you to something that was true. Okay, the, the disconnect is basically to do with reason, to basically you have this idea of non-duality, but then it disconnects with the real world. It disconnected with the scientific world. Now, what, what I'd say basically, what's changed is that you can finally, if you can articulate non-duality in a way that's completely scientific, completely exposed, apocalypse, unveiling of the hidden thing, completely open to ijtihad and critical analysis, there is a rational derivation of the, that idea through the left brain into, okay, obviously revision of history. You basically reinterpret history like we reinterpreted the Renaissance. But there's also then a direct derivation of morality, ethics, and legal systems. Now, if this, this idea of equality, charity, you know, kind of being nice to people, loving people, you know, you took it as a matter of faith that Jesus was a good guy, that somehow if I obey these things, then, you know, I'd lead a, lead a better life. That's taken on faith. But somehow if you can actually form a system that is completely rational, that's grounded in pure reason, then that, I think, is what's missing. And that, that's, that's what's really um, what can happen. It, you know, if all these uh, theorists we talked about earlier, these hard-nosed militant atheist theorists would, are talking in these terms anyway, now what if we can actually completely articulate that experience in completely rational terms? You give a foundation for what these hard-nosed, you know, often right-wing, left-brain people, a foundation from which they can rationalize into something more like, you know, enlightenment, renaissance, or even spiritual values. So I'd, I'd say basically that it is... I think the game has changed. I think basically there is a, a kind of the, um, you know, this revolution in uh, kind of mental conceptions, this kind of uh, reform of all knowledge will also include ethical and moral knowledge, I believe. And in terms of, you know, assholes and psychopaths and, you know, these Ayn Rand superheroes and the you know, kind of people, and it's, it's human nature, you know, basically I think, I think there is a kind of like, like, a, like a selfishness um, in, uh, in, in people, it's selfish genes, myself, my family, my clan, my race in that order, uh, which can actually lead to, to genocide. You know, George Price, mathematics of selfish genes is also the mathematics of, uh, of, of genocide. So, so, so I think basically you need something to rein in that. You need something to rein in the left brain. And I think if you can actually do it in a rational way, then I think it goes a long way to people, um, for people who might not accept scriptures or the teachings of the prophets. Does that make sense, Gail? 
And, you know, it's almost exactly what I've been thinking is you have to explain to the left brain people why the right brain stuff is correct. Well, um, right. But I also think you have to hold them in a different way. You know, it's sort of like you, we're not going to let you get away with that stuff um, uh, th that you're doing to sort of dominate all the rest of us. And it's how we operate as a human family to do that. So sort of in activism, you know, you sort of tend to get that white saviour behaviour, we're going to sort of save the world, whereas we, we have to do it as a global human family. And my understanding of sort of in-group, out-group effects is therefore something bigger than the human family has to be the enemy, uh, which is maybe where the concept of wet eco would become useful, or I think it's Urugu in African uh, heritage countries, you know, the, the sort of this ultimate evil so that, that we can know that we're battling something that we're not blaming certain people for. That's as far as I've got to on my thinking with this. Oh, right. I, I, I mean, I, I agree. And as, as a question, I mean, Yuval Noah Harari's, uh, his first book was really about narratives of corporation. And in a recent interview, actually a couple of years ago, he was, he was asked, you know, can you apply your narratives of corporation thing to the world? And his answer is yes, it's uh, we need this, what he calls a, a, a global identity, a mass global identity. But the best he can come up with is he says it's, it's not impossible. OK, so that's a start. But what, what, what I'd argue, basically, if you can show we, we, we did it with Islam, we're going to show in, in the next part of the talk. And, you know, basically with Islam and uh, European culture and also the Shia Sunni schism, how you can reconcile that. If you really can, you can reconcile the Sunni Shia schism, everything else is a walk in the park. So, so my answer to, you know, how you can really bring these people together is the reform of knowledge is a form of all worldview. And if you can make this worldview seem like the true Islam to Muslims, seem like the true, you know, European Renaissance to the nature of Europeanness to Europeans, et cetera, and, and uh, you know, what, what it means to be Chinese to Chinese people, then I think, I think that is really your, your common narrative that can actually, you know, bring us together. You know, Yuval Noah Harari says that it is times of crisis, but also a common enemy that can, uh, you know, that really bring people together. And I guess the common enemy in a sense is the environmental ecological catastrophe, which I know is very, very close to what, what you're involved in. And it's really important. And I think there is that. But I think the, the, the real thing which can really glue these social movements together is this notion of worldview, which we'll go into in the next next part of the talk. OK, that's that. if there's no other questions, we just move on and get on with it. OK, so any other questions? I guess not. I guess not. OK. Um, Time is moving on. We're going to just basically uh, just just do the rest of or, or just do the rest of the talk. OK, so. Um, uh, blah, what was it going to I need to um, I need to basically uh, go back to screen share. I need to go back to screen share. OK, so uh, very uh, stimulating, interesting questions. We, we're just basically going to apply. OK, uh, just, you know, what we talked about in the first half of the talk, this narrative. OK, this basically this template that um, we used to explain the life cycle, the myth cycle, the Renaissance and Islam. So basically, we're going to basically uh, apply it now to reality, to the current age. And we're going to show how this uh, template um, really completely explains uh, what, what's going on in the world today. So we're going to go from the Renaissance and um, history of Islam and a kind of abstract discussion into the real world, as in the world now. I'll go back to screen share now. So um, uh, select a window. OK, OK, so um, back to screen share, story of Islam. And how do we bring these two, you know, kind of divisions together? Okay, so here, here uh, screen share this. Oh, am I screen sharing? Yeah, I'm screen sharing. Are, are you seeing the diagram 21st century replay? Everybody? Yes. Uh, okay, so, so, okay, so, so you're seeing 21st century replay. Okay, it's, it's not clear on my screen. Okay. Okay, okay, so um, basically, we, we're going to apply the story we, we use to explain the Renaissance and, and Islam to the current world and show how the revolution is going to happen in the 21st century. Okay, so okay, so here's the story. Here's the storyline. It was a time of chaos and calamity, and people were worried. And there was a threat of uh, Camelot going into dis disarray. There was global warming, and there was basically wars and rumors of wars. And there's a search for an answer. It was really kind of Knights of the Grail were searching for this answer. How can we solve the problems of this world? And uh, so we, back to the beginning of this talk, how uh, these thinkers are kind of coming up with this answer that's heading towards the esoteric. OK, so the 21st century replay is different this time because the hidden factor returns. It returns through science. 
Okay, this is the apocalypse unveiling of the hidden thing, the Wada al Wujud of Islam, the kind of like central ideas of the Corpus Meticum. There's no, there's only one soul, there's only one life, there's only one matter. Who else can it be but the one God that somehow we are uh, divine, that all is one? Okay, it returned, the hidden factor returns through science. You can explain it in a way that makes, okay, it, it still sounds mad, but it's completely reasonable. Okay. So the hidden factor, and that's apocalypse, the hidden factor has returned, the batine has returned, the corpus medicum idea has returned in this idea that the progression of science brings it back. Okay, so things are different this time. It is the full return of the hidden factor. And once we have this hidden factor returned to point two, the fact that all these militant atheist thinkers, all these kind of like left-wing thinkers, you know, all these and, and, and progressive uh, new age thinkers are talking about this hidden factor anyway. They can't articulate it. Basically, you're saying what they're already thinking, but you're putting articulating it in a way that's absolutely explicit. So basically, you're, you're to uh, even someone like Sam Harris, someone like uh, Richard Dawkins, you can explain this truth to them. It doesn't, it, it, make, it will make perfect sense. They might not accept it, but it's completely reasonable. So once you have this in place, then you, you set out to reform all knowledge for the 21st century, which means you go out, obviously the, the world history is completely revised. We did it with the Renaissance and we did it with this hidden history of Islam to do with the Batin and this hidden teachings of Muhammad. And uh, you know, the process of science is going on. So we're increasing knowledge anyway. And the idea that we are close to something like total knowledge, well, not even know everything, but we know the main things. This is one thing missing to do with the brain and to do with uh, functional genomics and, and life basically. So, so from this, we reform all knowledge, legalistic, uh, kind of like return the foundations to liberal progressive values. We, we return the, the progressiveness to Islam through this, this, this very reasonable ijtihad critical analysis of the history of religion and how Islam was changed and how Europe, the European Renaissance stalled. And then, okay, once we have this kind of uh, worldview, which is the, the reform of all knowledge given this assumption, apocalypse completely revealed, we communicate this knowledge. Okay, so this is a very easy uh, kind of analogy. The, the new Gutenberg is obviously the internet. Okay, this is said of hundreds of times by, by hundreds of speakers. Um, and then basically organizing and making all knowledge accessible to all. Okay, a new world wide web, just, just laying out a new internet, a basically a new search engine, basically a new way of organizing. No paywalls, just let, let all out there and just basically put it all out there for everyone to learn and to, to, uh, to benefit from. And a new, this is just a return of the pan-sophism, all things to be taught to all people. Now here is the, uh, here is, is the interesting twist. The idea of Bildung has returned through people like writing about Nordic secret, basically it's returned. But what, what we suggest is we return the or original meaning of Bildung, which means shape oneself in the image of God, which means it's Kabbalah, it's Tantra. It means basically, yes, there is adult education, continuous education, civic responsibility, political activism, but you restore the core truth to the original meaning of Bildung. Okay, so, um, and then, okay, this is, uh, this is the, uh, I'll expand on this, the secret revolution in the zeitgeist. Okay, what um, Hegel analyzed the kind of French, American, uh, English revolutions. Okay, we're gonna expand on the secret revolution in the zeitgeist because we have to uh, really, uh, you know, just go into this because this is the prelude. This is essential for the actual physical revolution. And this is what, people don't understand who are often involved in these revolutionary movements. It's why uh, the revolutionary movements don't succeed. It's why academics say revolutions are a thing of the past because they don't understand this idea of a secret revolution. And this is exactly as Hegel anticipated. Okay, so look, the new secret revolution is this. We have a, a weak, weakness of existing worldviews. We know this, it's a time of crisis. So it's, we're in an interregnum period, you know, going back to Chris Hedges and Gramsci. This is the beginning of the talk. And this time of crisis, when in times of crisis, people are open to new ideas. There's a searching for some solution. Okay, so there's a searching, that there's a, the notion that existing worldviews are just not doing it anymore. Okay. And okay, so, um, okay, two, it's communicable to all people because this narrative, we did Islam and we did Europe but it extrapolates to India, China. It, it is absolutely universal. It is a universal mythic narrative. And, uh, you know, actually we, we did this in Q&A. Okay, Yuval Noah Harari, a, a kind of narrative of cooperation for the entire world. This is how you do it. 
So, so basically, it is, it is, it's not a new story. It's just basically showing that all the separate stories are the same story when you basically revise the history of Islam and, and the European Renaissance, like we did earlier on in the talk, you did it for the entire world. So, so it's basically, this is the narrative of convergence, really. This is basically the show that we all come from the same story. Now, the trick is to show the conclusion of the story involves all of us in this kind of unified kind of utopian vision. Okay, we're going to get to that. Okay, the reason why the secret revolution is will absolutely work, okay, why it's been so hard in the past, we've got the internet, we've got everything we talked about. It's the shocking familiarity of the new worldview and narrative. It, it is basically, it is familiar because, okay, one, we, we had all the thinkers earlier, you know, even atheist, militant atheist thinkers are talking about it anyway. So when it, when it, when this kind of new revelation comes, there's it, 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 going to be like a light bulb comes on. Oh my God, that's what we're talking about anyway. It's what we were anticipating anyway. All these, all these other thinkers we, we mentioned earlier on. And the fact that in pop culture is seeded everywhere. It's in Star Wars, it's in Beatles lyrics, Jimi Hendrix lyrics, you know, Jeff, you know, Bob Marley lyrics. It's in the book Moby Dick, America's greatest novel. America's uh, most popular poet, Rumi. Basically he was a Sufi. I can go on and on. It's seeded in popular culture, in, in pop music, pop, you know, children's fantasies, fairy tales, and, and also existing traditional religion and culture. You know, there's this idea in uh, political science that the ideologies which really have effect is the ide ideologies which, which can actually resonate with existing what they call cultural frameworks. And existing cultural frameworks is existing religion, is, is existing kind of like, you know, kind of, uh, kind of political ideologies. But when you can actually reinterpret these uh, religious and political ideologies like Hegelism, Marxism, and also Islam in terms of, uh, of alternative history, you're actually taking existing symbols and cultural reference points, but you're just merely reinterpreting those cultural reference points. So, so see, it's actually very, very uh, straightforward that this secret revolution than, than many people believe. And, and that we, this, this actually came out in earlier in the Q&A. Okay, you don't, have to, you don't have to convince everyone. You just need to convince a small percentage and these people are already seeking, okay, uh, the 3.5% the and, and the 25% uh, we've already mentioned. Now, when you, when you are trying to reach a 3.5%, you, you're, not, you're not wanting to reach a random sample of the population, okay, because a random sample of the population won't be into this kind of stuff. You just need the most active, the most intelligent, the best looking, the kind of really uh, most sensitive, the people who really just are, are more switched on. And these people will generally be more likely to be into this kind of worldview, okay? And, and the uh, staggering statistic of young people in this world is from a couple of years ago, 42% of all the people on this planet are under the age 24. That's a staggering statistic, isn't it? And there's another two, three billion people who are gonna appear on this planet in the next 10, 20 years, and they're all gonna be young people. Okay, uh, uh, kind of like a, a graph I made from, uh, fr from, um, from, from some recent research. Okay, and then this is the population forecast of 18 year olds. There's gonna be an explosion of 18 year olds in Britain over the next 10 years. And this is really the, the time scale over which this process in, in Britain is gonna unfold because I'm based in London basically. So this, this is how I see things. Now, now this graph is replicated. I mean, okay, France and Germany, it's, it's uh, France is kind of going down, but, but you'll find in, in the kind of most of the world, the Muslim world, the kind of third world up and coming countries, the, the kind of graph you see in Britain is replicated. So there's lots and lots of young people. Uh, Peter Turchin is a kind of scientist who wrote a, a paper 10 years ago in Nature, and it's uh, it made uh, a lot of discussion because he was saying basically that what really causes system change is not, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, a certain number of basically over-educated young people. Now, okay, you have unemployed young people, but you have over, un, underemployed. It is basically often sons and daughters of elites, of middle class, upper middle classes, basically, who can't find their place in society. And these are the people who really drive social change. So the Labour Party was quite left wing, it's quite revolutionary. But most of the uh, kind of new uh, kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, adherents are kind of like members of the new Labour Party who followed uh, Jeremy Corbyn, they're actually middle class. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting fact, isn't it? But anyway, okay, so let's continue how this unfolding will happen. Okay, so basically we, we continue our story. The secret revolution is very, very doable. And then it involves this kind of political revolution to, to like, like the Renaissance. So basically, instead of, you know, feudalism now, we have the abolition of tech feudalism. 
and rule by billionaire classes. Uh, and, uh, you know, the idea of rule by hedge fund manager and banker. Okay. So things like Concordia Mundi, these things don't go out of style. Uh, you know, these things are still, you know, valid for the 21st century. But now the technological aspect is such that basically now, instead of, you know, kind of like uh, the, the technology which Francis Bacon envisaged, we think that the, what can happen in our lifetimes is the ultimate technology. The technology that creates technology, the invention that invents. So we think in our lifetimes, this process of the unfolding from the Renaissance is going to reach a consummation. And for all intents and purposes, this is the panacea of Rosicrucianism. It is the kind of consummation of the process that Francis Bacon kind of initiated with the Royal Society and the uh, New Atlantis. And uh, the, you know, the, the spiritual redemption is really like, uh, the, you know, back to Sam Harris, restoring the mysteries of Eleusis. It's not, it's not just Sam Harris, many people in the psychedelic uh, kind of underground or whatever, they, they want to they do the same thing. And also, you know, it's a restor restoration of the, the esoteric mysteries, Tantra, Kabbalah, et cetera. So I've done another diagram, just expand on this, uh, you know, kind of like, um, kind of, you know, utopian vision. Okay, you know, basically um, this idea of uh, finally through true AI, fourth industrial revolution, we'll finally have universal basic income, what J. Maynard Keynes called the economic problem will finally be solved, kind of like material need will finally be met. And they shall hunger no more, they shall thirst no more, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat, book of revelation, you know, time of plenty, Islam, nowhere to give alms or charity. And the idea of basically using, uh, you know, basically changing, uh, like uh, taking the levers of power that you have to do in order to reverse global warming and ecological destruction for the simple reason that the powers that be are actively destroying the planet. So it is about you know, challenging the powers that be because of perverse subsidies. I mean, it's perverse because you know, hydrocarbon companies are subsidized to basically produce what we don't need that's destroying the planet, by oil, gas, et cetera. So basically uh, the kind of utopian vision has to be a kind of like a, you know, a, kind of like a, a challenge to existing powers. And uh, the, the idea of you know, regenerative agriculture, not just on the grassroots level, but if we can take it to a kind of like, you know, a kind of level where basically th there is energy on this planet that can really uh, help us to, uh, in terms of re regenerative, regenerative agriculture, it's not just, you know, kind of regenerating your allotment or your back garden. The idea there's energy on this planet in, in terms of, you know, um, isotopes of hydrogen in the oceans, uh, the, the, the idea that um, a few cubic kilometers, this is a fact, a few cubic kilometers of seawater contain uh, the, the, the hydrogen isotope deuterium, uh, the, the, the fuel for fusion power. And a few uh, a cubic uh, kilometers of seawater contains as much energy as all the oil, gas, and coal that's ever existed on this planet. This technological revolution we're talking about, we, we can harness this power. We can basically not just explore the stars, we can basically reverse global warming and ecological destruction. We can green the Sahara, we can green the Gobi Desert, we can green the Australian outback, which was, you know, kind of like a uh, rainforest at one time before it was slashed and burned by uh, the ancestors of Aborigines, apparently. And, you know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, spiritual redemption of humankind, basically once this truth is revealed, you know, this idea that many new age people, people like Jamie Wheel, people like, um, as I'm talking about anyway, to, to revive these kind of ancient ways of attaining these peak stakes and, you know, Sarah Harris talking about reviving the mysteries of Lucius, then really, I think uh, once we have, you know, universal global income, this technological revolution, it really sets the scene for this kind of uh, enables us to really do the spiritual redemption of, uh, <clears throat> of, of humankind. Now, now, just to finish, I, I, think, I think just to finish uh, this talk, because there are quite a few revolutionaries in the audience, um, I, will, I will go through the slide, uh, take a few minutes to go through the slide, which is, um, I was going to leave out, I was going to just gauge how many uh, kind of uh, system changes and revolutionaries would show up. Okay, so okay, there's a critical mass here we have. Okay, a uh, critical mass theory. Okay, 21st century revolution replay. It's so, so doable because, okay, one, there's increasing calls for system change anyway and a great reset when even your establishment is calling for some radical change. I think, uh, you know, these, these young people, you know, these kind of like, uh, you know, like billions and billions of young people, this kind of like 42% uh, uh, under age 24, et cetera, when they fully realize what's happening in the world as ecological environmental catastrophe rolls on, 
they're going to get really angry. And I think in terms of the, what, you know, they don't want to sound like a Marxist, but the structural conditions of this world is really ripe for this change to happen. People are expecting it. People, even the billionaire classes are kind of like um, a meeting uh, hosted by Michael Milken, the actual junk bond king. Uh, it, was, it was hedge fund managers, billionaires in attendance. They were warned, basically, if things don't change, there's going to be revolution. If, if even your billionaire classes are recognizing revolution is brewing, they're basically, you've got to channel this energy into something, into something better. And, and after COVID, you know, the COVID uh, coronavirus thing, the, the so-called Overton window is blown open. You just don't know what's up ahead. You know, it's, it's basically the, the possibilities are just open wide. Okay, we've gone through this tech feudalism, surf, serfdom, you know, ruled by Zuckerberg and Musk. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Zuckerberg and, and Musk and I will have amazing conversations, but I don't want to be ruled by them, you know? I don't want them to be the <laughs> near aristocracy. I don't want to, I don't want billionaires controlling the government and, and the legal system. So, okay, okay, point three, addressing the weakness of existing social, social movements. It's this, okay. You have social movements based on specific grievances and specific issues. You have social movements with particular manifestos, particular a kind of list of demands, particular constitutions. And you have social movements with specific ways of organizing specific protest techniques, even specific strategies that have appeared over the past several decades. Political theorists, come to the conclusion again and again they don't cause a system change and the reason they don't cause system change is because of the lack of the secret revolution and the fact that they're not bound together by world view so I'm not saying you know you don't need i'm not saying you don't need protests you don't need organizing you don't need all these things that the social movements are doing but the real glue which is missing which the real glue which enables these uh, movements to scale up and to kind of, you know, what left wing is called to unite diverse struggles into something more composite and more effective is exactly world view. And the, the weakness of academic study of revolution, why many academics say revolution is impossible, you know, it's a thing of the past, is because academia does not do world view. It's all postmodern. Academia does not, doesn't do religion. And if the answer is found in this hidden esoteric religion, then no wonder academics can't envisage how revolution could possibly happen. Okay, finally, I think, I think I'll, look, I think I'll um, end the talk now with the last point, because uh, basically we've really um, gone on. I'm gonna really finish with the last point. Okay, so basically the, the, uh, the ultimate uh, thing, why uh, this worldview this esoteric worldview is revolutionary is because this hidden religion, this true religion is inherently antinomian, is inherently revolutionary. You know, there's, a, there's an idea that religion is about control. Okay, the Catholic Church, um, you know, the, um, the, the caliphate in Islam. Let me tell you, a false religion is about control. True religion is truly revolutionary. You have it with Jesus. He, was, he basically upset the status quo. He challenged the, the priestly caste. The incident in the temple was a challenge of the taxation system. Buddha really upset the status quo. He was a warrior caste challenging the Brahmins. He said women and, uh, and uh, you know, kind of non-Brahmins could be enlightened. The Brahmins hated him. You know, he survived several assassination attempts. How he died, po you know, uh, poison, um, poisonous mushrooms given to him by a woodman could have been the, the last assassination attempt that, that, that succeeded. And obviously Muhammad basically upset the Meccan status quo. Okay, now, now the prophecies for the coming of the future religion, again, it, it is revolutionary. And we, we, we talked about the Freemason -led re re revolutions of, of, uh, that emerged from the Renaissance and, uh, and, uh, and the Enlightenment. <clears throat> but it's a, it's a very general thing. And in the future, I mean, I worked in a Church of England, a Church of England church for ten years, St James's. I worked, you know, in, in a established church, okay, Church of England, the Church of of the State, okay. Do you know that the ten years I was working there in the Sunday services, I never heard a single sermon about the Book of Revelation. There was not a single sermon about prophecies, okay. The Pentecostals pack them in talking about prophecies, but the end is nigh. But the Church of England doesn't talk about it, and it's because it's about the, the good guys challenging the kings and queens of the world. So no wonder the Church of England, the Church of you know the kings and queens of England, don't talk about the the the, the Book of Revelation. 
And the same for Islam, you know, in the, the prophecies for Islam, the future state of Islam, it is basically a force which will challenge the political and uh, kind of religious elites of the time. So I'm saying once you resurrect this hidden religion and actually show what it is, then it is inherently revolutionary. And I think that's a very, very uh, powerful uh, kind of uh, message to uh, give to the world right now. I, I, it's a matter of channeling, channeling all this young, angry energy, this, uh, you know, uh, Peter Turchin overqualified young people energy into something constructive instead of having that energy rip society apart. Okay. So I'm going to end the talk there and basically just go into um, more kind of discussion Q&A now. So I think that is the kind of like, I, I guess summing up is, uh, you know, basically, yes, this, this, this uh, worldview narrative is exactly what these thinkers are saying anyway. We're just saying it's going to appear big style for the 21st century. And it's basically really what these uh, people are seeking after anyway. Well, once you can fully communicate it to these people, then I think you, you set up a chain reaction of things which people want to happen. And I think it will just uh, have a life of its own. So I'm just putting these ideas out there to uh, start this kind of like new renaissance for the 21st century. So any, any questions, any questions at all? Okay, I'll stop, I'll stop the screen share and uh, any, any questions, or else, or else I'll go home and have my dinner. <laughs> so any questions, anybody? Yeah, I'll go for one if, you, if I can. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, Oliver, yeah, Oliver. Yeah, go sure. So I heard this one from earlier, actually. Um, I must admit, I think the last part of the talk sort of uh, washed over me, but um, from earlier. So you talked about the missing narrative and how that would uh, inform uh, the new worldview and how that would affect uh, how that would affect the new world worldview. The Holy Grail is going to affect the new worldview. Yeah, yeah. And I can sort of intuit how that is going to work. But do you can you give like an example of like one aspect that might shift? I mean, I mean, you know, I think, I think on, on one level we have this grand worldview, okay, and and I, th I think, I think it is the glue, the kind of overall glue, which kind of like, you know, kind of like uh, binds social movements together. But at the end of the day, you need to basically, uh, you, you basically need to find champions of the worldview acting on a grassroots level. So what you need to do, you need to take this kind of like great, great worldview, okay, this great kind of like constellation of ideas. What you need to do, you need to distill certain points from that worldview, and you need to find champions of that those certain points to implement aspects of the worldview. And these people will start organizations, they will start movements, they will start, you know, uh, corporations, uh, cooperatives, and and even companies to basically implement the worldview. W what it is, I mean, the uh, the, the uh, one thing you trying to instigate system change, you're basically instigating the same conditions which uh, led to the revolutions which happened in Europe and, and in Islam through this kind of secret revolution. Okay, but then on another level, uh, basically you have to implement the worldview. And that means you have to specify the worldview in terms of political program. You have to actually specify it in terms of these kind of constellated distilled kind of little diamonds that people can grab onto. So most people are not interested in worldview, but you need the worldview to get the brightest and the best and these kind of people who are going to be your leaders, your activists, your kind of bloggers, your kind of like, uh, you, 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 need it, you need the big picture, but most people will basically take this kind of distilled aspect and it could be a thing like, you know, eco-activism, it could be for something like regenerative agriculture, it could be, uh, you know, kind of like young Muslims who really feel a, a, kind, of, a, a kind of a sense of, a need for a kind of like, yes, they, they want to keep their Muslim identities and they want to keep their traditions, but they want to somehow want to integrate, like in Europe, I meet these people all the time. I'm one of them, basically, I'm looking as, a, as an immigrant living in this country. Basically, I, you know, I love my, my culture, but there was this kind of desire for some kind of, you know, integrating worldview that is European and Chinese, you know what I'm saying? Th that's another aspect. So I think, I think you distill certain points and that these specific points are what get implemented. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm going to watch this back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean the, uh, the, 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 we went through a lot of information in the, uh, the, the second section to just to, just to, just to, um, 
I, I guess the summing up of the second section was the, the replay of the Renaissance for the 21st century. So, so I, th I think we, we say, uh, you know, the feature, a kind of map for system change, a cognitive mapping for system change, I, I think it doesn't work if you present something completely new. And I think what you need, you basically need that, that uh, kind of like uh, that, that, that familiarity with tradition. The fact you're saying basically what we're attempting is basically a replay of the Renaissance. There in itself, you have the integrating of left wing and right wing. So there's one, okay, look, it works like this. The left wing is completely lost. I mean, it's embarrassing. The, the left wing is embarrassing, okay? I, I'm embarrassed to be called left leaning, okay, or left wing, because I'm not really. But in fact, you talk about revolution and kind of progressiveness and all this kind of stuff. You, you, you call it liberal and left. But really, the state of the left wing today is embarrassing. It really is. Okay, look, what, what's needed is a revival of the left wing in terms of the original cosmological um, metaphysical assumptions which underpin the left wing. But when you understand that these uh, then uh, kind of put in place your ideas of you know, equality, liberty, fraternity, equal dignity, uh, sanctity of human life and all that kind of business, they're, they're basically, okay, one, um, you, you inspire that revolutionary energy again, ideas of utopia, but then you also reconcile the left wing with the right wing because what right wing people like is not feudal, you know, feudal monarchy from back in medieval times. They like what the original left wing brought about. Did, did you get it? Traditionists are not going back to the divine right of kings to rule. What traditionists, the right wing now likes is basically what the original left wing brought in place. Now, once you resurrect the original left wing, then that's the perfect reconcil reconciling of left and right. Okay, we, we didn't uh, do this in the main part of the talk, but in terms of Shia Sunni, once you reestablish the Batin, then you, sh you show Sunni and Shia basically what is the original truth of uh, Islam to reconcile the inner with the outer. And there's another reconciliation. So in, in terms of you know, uh, concrete, uh, specific things, the worldview is grand, but it, it involves basically, at the end of the day, people. You need to basically uh, convince people of the worldview and you need those individuals to implement the worldview either as, uh, you know, separately as individuals, or as organizers and activists and protagonists. So does that kind of answer your earlier question? Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. Are you familiar with um, the, the Jacobins, which is like the, uh, I guess, the uh, uh, sort of branch of the Pythagoreans, and, and, and that's like a left-wing movement, um, Jacobin uh, magazine, for example. Well, well, yeah, I actually read some of the posts on uh, some of my kind of left-leaning uh, Facebook posters. You, you, I read their articles. I think there's, there's, a, there's a vast array of kind of like left and right kind of sentiments out there. You know, I mean, Jacobin has a kind of negative connotation of the French Revolution, which kind of kind of went pear shaped. So um, maybe maybe it wasn't the best name for the magazine in in some eyes. What I'm about is really reconciling polarities. So you know, there was a a critique of the fact that I was not singing the praises, but I was mentioning Jordan Peterson from uh, you know someone who's sympathetic to what I'm saying, but I didn't get flack from Jordan Peterson fans. What, what I'm about is reconciling dualities. So I'm not left wing or right wing. I'm actually both. So, you know, I, you know, I listened, I've got Marxist friends and I've got capitalist friends, you know, Christ, I'm, I was born in Hong Kong, you know, I'm, I'm not alien to capitalism. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so what I'm about is not, is not, you know, I'm ever so spiritual, I'm God and, you know, I don't take care of you know, material things. It has to be both, basically. So I think in terms of the social movement that can really, uh, you know, change uh, things in a, in a, and actually get vast numbers of people on board, it has to rec reconcile all the polarities of society, left and right, progressive, conservative, environmentalist, technologist. So um, yes, I mean, uh, Jacobin is one kind of, uh, you know, maybe quite far left um, kind of viewpoint, which I'm not totally unsympathetic with, but what I'm really about is kind of like the, the entire spectrum of viewpoints and trying to reconcile all dualities. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, this really chimes with, you know, the, 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 the sort of current movement of the old, the old middle, as it were, like the, um, you know the the integrals and the and the metamoderns sort of converging on synthesis of uh, opposing points of view. Well, well yeah, it, it is it is uh, it is basically um, the lot of other people thinking you know trying to trying to do this. I mean, my I guess I guess my 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 uh, my unique angle, which I was gonna I was gonna um, kind of kind of put into the main body of the talk but uh just for, just for lack of time because it, it was a uh, lots of uh 
it, it's, it's, it, there was lots of material covered and it was, it was getting on as attention spans are only so long. So, so it's basically, I mean, I've done my unique, my unique angle in other talks basically. So, so everything I've said tonight kind of stands separate from my own work, which is to do with the brain and artificial intelligence. Okay, so, so, so I'd say uh, basically I, I uh, you know, I, I agree with what, what these people are doing, but what's really needed to push things along is this kind of X factor, I think. And I think, I think everything I said tonight, I mean, it's, it's all good and well, but I think there's a time limit going on basically. So I think the time limit is that basically that, um, you know, the ecological environmental catastrophe, it really is rolling on. It's going to get, you know, it's not just, you know, the last uh, bit of ocean, you know, kind of like exploited, the last tree cut down. It's really the idea that wars will start as, as things get hotter and hotter and, you know, um, ecological environmental calamity will make the planet hotter and make war more likely than nuclear war and all that kind of stuff. So I guess there's a real time limit. I guess, I guess what I do personally um, that may be something different from what all these other movements which are trying to do as well, is uh, I, th I think um, basically what, what, what I'm really about, apart from talking about these, you know, these, this, this political stuff, is my own work, which is to do with uh, the brain and artificial intelligence. So, so I think uh, for, for me, uh, it's not to get involved with specific you know, movements like Jacobin or Metamodern or whatever, mm. okay, one, I'm about simplification, but really uh, you know, what, what I'm about is basically Okay, communicating these ideas for people to use, just throw it out there. But the real thing I need to do is just uh, basically create true AI. So, so the big, um, I'll go back to screen share again. I'll basically, I'll go over two slides, which I um, basically uh, kind of cut out. So basically the, uh, the, 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 the two slides is this, basically. I think, I think what will um, kind of really just make this uh, little revolution, put it into steroids is, is this, okay. So, so I've, I've talked about this in other talks, but basically I, what, I, what I do is I keep a separation from my own work with the religious and uh, political stuff. So the two talks I gave in November actually made no mention of my own work in, with the, uh, the brain and functional genomics and artificial intelligence. No, no, I mean, the, the, the talk about artificial intelligence was really about, look, these are the, uh, in November, these are the specific major problems in artificial intelligence. And in that talk, I basically addressed all of those problems with pure neuroscience and some aspects of this, this kind of theory I've been working on to do with the brain and functional genomics. Now, now let me just uh, quickly explain this in five minutes. Okay, so I think this is, um, this is my own invention. So look, take, take this as something I believe in. It's like, like a matter of faith. I believe that this is right. And this is a kind of like key to putting everything I've said tonight on steroids. Okay, so basically, now, now the, the, the talk on the unification of science and religion, okay, that relied on science that's open source, it's all out there. Okay, the talk in November, you know, YouTube um, type science and the full resurrection of, of uh, uh, the core truths of religion for the 21st century. What I used was all science that's out there, okay. Now the science that is not out there is basically the, the final two pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in science, which is to do with life and intelligence. There's a missing theory of life. There's a missing theory of intelligence. Okay, so okay, okay. This okay, I'll say it as a as a kind of like uh, okay, a, a matter of faith. I believe that this is what I've been working on for the past you know thirty years, and this is something which I will kind of produce in the coming months and years to come. Okay, it's this. It, it is a huge scientific idea. What I think I've discovered is this. Okay, I've made a discovery. I want to explain what it is. Okay, okay, this is my huge discovery. The huge discovery is that, okay, there exists a symmetry between life and intelligence in exactly the same way that this is exactly analogous to E equals MC squared. Now, Einstein came up with this idea of there being a symmetry between energy and matter. In fact, Einstein wanted to call his theory of relativity invariance theory, as in symmetry, invariance. There's something invariant about mass and energy, but there's an invariance theory at the time, so he couldn't. Okay. Now, what I'm saying is, uh, okay, there's this thing in the universe called life, and there's this thing in the universe called intelligence that's just as fundamental as matter and energy. And what I'm saying is there's a perfect symmetry that exists between life and intelligence. Now, let me unpack this uh, diagram, which is in the book uh, of, of five years ago, but it's much more developed now. So it's really progressing. My, 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 my political ideas, the religious ideas, the, uh, this work on this AI, fractal brain, genome, life, intelligence, symmetry theory, 
you know, progresses one mocker at a time, really day by day it progresses. Okay, okay, this is the big idea. Okay, now, now like equals MC squared, life, there's a perfect symmetry between life and intelligence. And uh, recently in the past couple of years with the COVID lockdowns, I've really been a flesh out, okay, see, I'm wiggling the, the, the cursor, whereas this gene and neuron, I've really been out in the past two years, really flesh out um, in detail because new research has come out. As I read this huge thick book called Dendrites. I read it in a year and a half ago during the first lockdown. And it's really provided the, the kind of like uh, knowledge which literally discovered in the past 10 years to make the perfect symmetry between a neuron and a gene. Now I explain this in other talks and it's not obvious, you know, a neuron is like a tree and a gene is like a string. It's not obvious at all. But I can show there's a perfect symmetry between how a gene works and how a neuron works. I can show that in, 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 from that, I can show there's a perfect symmetry between how a gene regulatory network works and a neuro, neuronal network. So you're going up this diagram. And then I can show there's a perfect symmetry between a genome and a brain. And then a perfect symmetry between development, ontogenesis, and thought and behavior. So what does a genome compute? A genome computes ontogenesis, the uh, kind of, uh, you know, development of a body. So what does a brain compute? A brain computes thought and behavior. I can show there's a perfect symmetry between both. And, and this is idea above here is actually quite widely, uh, is the existing idea which is quite widely believed that there should exist a symmetry between evolution and learning and creativity. It's somehow evolution is happening in the brain. It's neural Darwinism, it's MEMS, it's uh, you know, this idea of genetic algorithms basically. Okay, I've taken things far further. So I, I, sh I should show there's a perfect symmetry across. Now like this is the big idea, like, this, this is huge. Okay, look, do, do you see, the, the two sides of the diagram, a gene, okay, genome, gives rise to a body and a brain. Okay, now, in turn, the body and the brain contains neurons, neural networks. So see, the, the left side of the diagram, you can stack it on, on to, the, the, you can have it, you know, you know the, the, sorry, the right side, you can stack it on top of the, the left side, you can see. So, so if you take the diagram on, 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 the, on the left, life, you can stack the, the intelligence diagram on top of it because from a gene, gene regulatory networks and genome, you have ontogenesis, which produces a body and brain, but then the body and brain, the symmetry which shows, goes on to work like a giant genome. Now, I'll tell you a simple fact, okay? It's a simple fact that everything in your life has happened from a single singularity. It's happened from a point, okay? It's the point of fertilized, fertilizing of the egg. So back to the cosmic cycle again, you know, back to the life cycle again, we, we talked about earlier. From that point, your entire life emanated. An egg was fertilized. And that's, it's, it's profound, it's deep. Every single thing you've done, every single protein manufactured in your body, every single spasmodic movement, every inspired thought, everything, every neuron, every cell in your body has come from that point. Okay, your entire life, if that point didn't happen, nothing in your life would happen. Okay, now, now here's the incredible thing. Okay, so, so it's a fact, there's a single continuous emanation, a single chain of causality from that point to everything in your life. What I've been able to show is that there is a single language, a mathematical language to describe all that, everything that happens from a single fertilized egg. And there's also a single calculus that can describe all that. And it's recursively self-modifying. Now here's the, okay, here's the mind blowing thing. Okay, look, the diagram on, on the left to do with life, evolution, development, ontogenesis. Okay, I take that, okay, imagine that that's one column. And I put the other column on top of it, okay? All those points, learning, creativity, thought, behavior, brain, neuronal network, neuron, okay? Now here's the mind blowing idea I'm gonna basically tell you, and it's, and it's shocking, it's absolutely shocking. It is possible, and it takes some explaining, I can't do it in five, 10 minutes, but I'll do it in future talks. It is possible to take everything in that diagram, okay, as, as one vertical line, and it's possible to take a symmetry across the entire column and reduce it to a single monad. I know what you're saying. You're saying that's impossible. You're saying, but your know, neurons are structure and evolution's a process, but that's impossible. You're talking about process and structure. No, no, it, it, it works because it's recursively self-modifying. I've invented a recursively self-modifying calculus where every element in the calculus is structure and process. So a neuron is but a structure, but a neuron encodes a process, you see. So what I'm saying is basically this theory has distilled itself to such a point that it's arrived at a level of abstraction, I'm saying basically is essentially the monad. Look, the, the language of the, okay, this next diagram, the language of the theory is described in what's called uh, formal axiomatic systems. Let me, let me tell you something about mathematics and what's called ling, you know, linguistics, um, the study of language, okay. 
Noam Chomsky uh, basically has this idea of universal grammar, that there's a kind of distillation of all human language into this kind of minimal abstract theory. Okay, that's, that's uh, kind of like what, what he's saying. And, uh, and uh, there's this idea of what he calls the strong minimalist thesis. It's the ultimate distillation of universal grammar. I suggest there is as strong as possible minimalist thesis of the universal grammar. Okay, that's, that's, that's linguistics and language. Okay, now in mathematics, there is a distillation of all mathematics into something called set theory. That's the great uh, work of the 20th century Principia Mathematica that uh, Bertrand, uh, Bertrand Russell, Alfred North Whitehead. They reduce all mathematics to set theory, but there's a further distillation. It's called formal axiomatic systems. Okay, it's really, really, really abstract. Now, look, let me, let me tell you that, this, that you cannot draw a perfect distinction between language language, like Noam Chomsky, Noam Noam Chomsky would study, and mathematics. Because for the simple fact that you can say, you can say in language all mathematical formula, it might be very robust, but you can say it. You can say logic, you can say formal axiomatic system, you, you can recite it. But when you arrive at the simplest formal axiomatic system, there's a notion of idea of what is the simplest formal axiomatic system. Now, uh, Gregory Chaitin, who's one of the great uh, kind of uh, mathematicians in the world, in, in my opinion, he has uh, proposed uh, the, the question of, is there a dynamic formal axiomatic system that can generate all formal axiomatic systems? And I say there is. And I say that this most minimal formal axiomatic system that can, that can generate all other formal axiomatic systems is the same as Chomsky's most minimal, strong minimalist thesis, most minimal distillation of universal grammar. And what I'm also saying is that this monad, this ultimate distillation of linguistics and mathematics is identical to the distillation of this life intelligence symmetry theory. So that's the big idea. So going back to this diagram here, it is basically everything in this diagram distills to a single recursively self-modifying monad. Now that's pre-Socratic, that's pre-Pythagoras, mm. but that is esoteric religion taking it to its logical conclusion. Okay, it takes some explaining to unpack this idea, but can you see the logic of what I'm saying? Can you see the reasonableness of what yeah. I'm saying? It takes mm. some explaining, but I'm saying I've, I've stumbled on something. It's really, really deep. In order to explain, okay, and, and I, I go on. I mean, the talk in November, Basically, I show how to create true artificial intelligence based just on existing neuroscience that's out there. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is this theory totally connects with everything I said in that November talk. It's one unified theory. Everything I said in that new, uh, November talk, which doesn't even mention this work I've just described, totally connects with this work, you see. And I think this is really the, the kind of key to realizing the secret revolution and also to bring about this, uh, you know, this, this, this consummation of the renaissance enlightenment utopian project to create artificial intelligence okay so uh, okay well, I, I, i've kind of like um that, that, that was supposed to be the ending of the talk which i kind of like it's beautiful i put into q a so any uh, any uh response or questions yes to that? wait i have a question can you hear me uh, this oh, is oh, yes. oh, yeah 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 man man um so uh is your recursive and the previous, uh, the previous slide, um, oh, is yeah, it teleological? It. Is there a teleology to it? Uh, okay. The recursive the... self-modification. I mean, it could just be a circular mm -hmm. system, but if there's, it, it, it might be a three, you know, multi-dimensional spiral with some teleological, I, you know, I, 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 I think that's missing off this diagram. Oh, yeah, 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 look, 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 look. So, so we've got exactly the answer for you. We've got exactly the answer. Basically, this is one aspect of it. What I've described is the kind of forward diverging into possibilities. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what we dis discussed in the November talk was this idea of teleology, exactly that, that we can explain teleology using, okay, let, let me explain for other people who maybe didn't hear that talk. Okay. This idea of this idea of a big bounce, okay, that the big bang is not the beginning. Okay, so, so basically this idea of, let, let me explain it quickly, I mean, because it's interesting. Okay, this idea that, okay, the Big Bang is not the beginning, it's the Big Bounce. Okay, and uh, there, there's a previous epoch to the universe before the Big Bang. Okay, now, now from string theory and loop quantum gravity, which are the two main contenders of, you know, grand unified theory, they both right. predict a pre-Big Bang epoch that is the mirror image of this universe in this epoch. 
Now, the significance of that is basically there's a, a principle called CPT symmetry, which is perfectly scalable to the entire universe. Absolutely foundational to physics. Okay, you, you take away CPT symmetry, modern physics falls apart. Okay, the, the thing about CPT symmetry is basically, okay, if you reverse a charge polarity time, you have to, any one of those uh, symmetries, you have to reverse all the others. Okay. Now, now, what they found, the string theorists and the, uh, the loop quantum gravity people, is they found that the, the pre-Big Bang epoch is a mirror image of this universe. But if you flip the, the, uh, you know, the polarity mirror image, you have to flip time and charge, which means the pre-Big Bang, Big Bang epoch, antimatter is matter, matter is antimatter, but also means that time is going the other way. But if the Big Bang is the uh, bounce point, it means we are bouncing back to the origin. Okay, Zoltan, do you get it? That's teleology, yeah? Yeah. Okay, now, now, there's another idea which I discussed in November, which is the idea of, uh, okay, uh, I, I, I can't remember his name now. It's uh, Yaka Aharonov, the, uh, the Israeli US scientist. Okay, destiny wave func function from the future. Okay, look, look, this, 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 this now connects with uh, the, uh, the, the uh, recursive self-modification. So teleology all the way. Uh, you know, string theory, loop quantum gravity. Now, his idea is um, a, a destiny wave function from, from the future. So basically, he's taken quantum uh, mechanics and he's time inverted it. Okay, so he's time reversed it. Okay, now, now the thing is, quantum mechanics is a kind of explosion into a supposition of possibilities. And there's a collapse of the wave function in one of those possibilities. Now, what he's saying is there is a teleological backward in time emanation in the same way. Okay. So that kind of fits together with the, the kind of uh, you know, Big Bang inversion thing we, we talked about earlier. Now, in terms of this theory of recursive self-modification emanation from a point, that is what is lacking the teleological aspect. But what I'm saying is, okay, the teleological aspect is basically the idea that basically, you know, like, like, like the evolution of humanity, the evolution of world history basically converges to a point. So basically, uh, in terms of emanation, in terms in our minds, what we have is, is a backward emanation from goal states. Okay, here's, here's the beautiful thing, okay, in terms of full circle. If there's a single emanation from a fertilized egg, okay, in, in, your, in your life, okay, everything emanates from a fertilized egg, there's a central goal encoded by your hypothalamus from which your knowledge web emanates backwards. Your, your chain of causality, your chain of meaning, purpose emanates from this central goal and it's the goal of fertilizing eggs. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? Full circle. So yes, there's a forward emanation from a fertilized egg, but in your life, there's also a backward emanation of all these things you need to do to fertilize eggs. Mm -hmm. But that backward emanation is as like the kind of uh, you know, time symmetric quantum mechanic going backwards in time, in time uh, kind of uh, emanation. So, so that is a kind of like, in terms of uh, you know, what we talked about earlier about the life cycle, that fits in with the earlier, you know, the mythic cycle, the life cycle we talked about earlier in the talk. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it does. You know, you know, this, this worldview, the, the puzzle pieces, they fit together perfectly. It is yeah. one organic unity. Yeah. So, so in, but... in, in these talks, I mean, this is like the 20th anniversary of these talks. I mean, literally, it's, it's uh, the, the, world, the worldview in my head has really for, uh, kind of evolved with the talks. So what's happened is basically these, these knowledge, these knowledge blocks have basically come together and it's all the puzzle pieces, they fit together into one composite, perfectly dovetailing whole. Mm. Okay, so is that um, any but other question? What about uh, Gerdel? Uh, you mentioned the logical axioms, <clears throat> but Gerdel put a kink into that. <laughs> so, sorry, so what was the question? Uh, well, your logical axioms in mathematics turns out to be incomplete per Gödel, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, this this goes goes back to Gödel. Gödel, when you have when we when, when you're talking about dynamic formal axiomatic systems, they also generate axioms. The thing about Gödel is basically okay. if there's anything that uh, you know the the system can't. Um, can't de you can't derive from the existing axioms and the you know the formal axiomatic system? There's a way around it, and, and Gödel recognizes you basically make that oh. thing part of the set of axioms. But okay. if your actual we're not talking about formal axiomatic systems here, we're talking about dynamic formal axiomatic systems that generate axiomatic systems. So you can actually generate continuously axioms. Mm. Does that Got make it. sense? So it kind of bypasses. Yes, it does. 
Okay, it kind of bypasses Godel. Is that uh, is, is interesting, isn't okay. it? Okay. Okay. Any other questions? The marathon talk absolutely covered a lot of ground. Uh, My God, we actually. I have a question, if you if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Who, who's that? It's Ollie again. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Let's go. I think my camera's on somewhere. Okay. Um, can't okay, see I turn off the screen share. Okay, I turn off the screen share too. Um, looks all dark as well, like mysterious. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it might be really layering the tone to bring in like you know some mainstream science, but um, I'm interested in the way that <laughs> I'm interested in the way that this. This sort of big bounce idea, which I which I more and more sort of subscribe to, or this idea of a, um, a teleology. Te well, teleology, yes, but also like the idea that the alpha and omega are like the same thing. You know, that they're sort of moving away and towards it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. But I'm interested in how that how that how does that tie in with you know what we can predict about about the physical what we call the physical universe and and sort of heat death and all that you know and how does that i mean how, how does the the conscious experience sort of survive that or, or sort of you know exist alongside that well, well I, th I think it goes back to um what, what we discussed in the november talk that basically that uh you, you know it is back to idealism that uh the universe on one level is what you see, but there is this idea which is very ancient, which people like Max Tegmark have, have, have restored. The notion that uh, the universe doesn't really exist, it really exists as a mathematical object. So it's back to German idealism. I, I think the idealists were right. I think basically that the only thing you really can know is your first person subjective experience. And the, uh, the resurrection of this ancient Pythagorean idea or pre-Pythagoras, probably from back from Egypt, is one that um, but, but it, it is right. And so the universe, heat death, you know, beginning to end, uh, you know, the heat death thing, I, I, I don't think it's right. It's just one idea. The idea of a cyclical universe has actually come back in vogue because of this thing called dark energy, basically. You know, Roger Penrose, the, the Nobel Prize winner from, from a couple of, actually last year, he's been uh, championing cyclical universes for a long time. And Einstein entertained the idea. So uh, the idea um, that uh, empirical evidence back then didn't support, but this new kind of empirical evidence does support. So I think the heat death idea um, is, is, is kind of like one of those ideas. At the end of the day, you know, you can't prove anything in science. What you can do is you can take these kind of jigsaw puzzles and piece them together in such a way to form a composite picture, which mm. is, is consistent. I think at the end of the day, that's what, that's what you can do. And if you can mm. use those for political ends and actually reestablish uh, you know, certain spiritual truths, then there's a kind of purpose to it. At the end of the day, you can't really prove these things at the end of the day. Uh, you're talking about mundane, normal science. <laughs> <laughs> so you, we're being opportunist and being practical here. I mean, you know, uh, the, 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 I think the only truth I know is one consciousness. And the, the, the truth which I discovered in my 20s, you know, with the Lotus Eaters, as, as the last talk, and also later on in other religious experiences I had later on, is that yes, there's one consciousness, but basically this one consciousness has a state of being God, <laughs> okay? Mm. So that, that is something I, you know, basically I, you know, call, some people call me deluded, but that's something that's so real to me. And uh, I think what I can do is then interpret science in such a way, interpret all knowledge in such a way that everything, all knowledge in the world becomes consistent with that only certainty I can possibly have. One consciousness and this idea mm -hmm. that this one consciousness, it can also experience itself as being totality of all experience and all, all existence. Okay, does that <laughs> make sense? I have some remarks why I'd, I'd love to make. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, it seems like this is now just in support of your hypothesis that a, a new re renaissance could perhaps be possible in our 42% of global population being under the age of 24. If you look at where we're at, I'm not a nitpicker on scientific theory because that's not my expertise. But if I zoom out and look at where we actually are at in history, you are saying we have an ontological singularity that, that we could, could use to actually show the collapse of spirit science and all, all the, you know, the kind of central merger point of all the disciplines to explain the archetypal universe to our under 24s. 
it's actually quite fortunate that we've we've now come through the technological singularity as de delusional and as sort of vainglorious as the search uh, you know for the technological singularity has been it's a fucking damp squib but yeah, yeah, and yeah, and that's yeah. part of the juvenile awakening and it almost feels like we we have a a grouping of global population who is not so tied to their history that they're an enthusiastic about starting from the present and kind of looking to the future. That's the joy of working with the um, with the sentiments and the and and the the zeal of the young. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I am dustbinning uh, slightly older groups of individuals to yeah. the obscurity, of, of course, by saying this kind of thing. But I'm I'm trying to give you some support for this movement to really take hold in in those um, who can learn the lessons and the vaingloriousness of the chase for the technological singularity, which we have now proven in the external political um, realm to have been abused by a, a small majority, all of that. The oh, journey okay. for me speaks ab about moving away from the external locus of control and then in rooting the, 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 the merger of science and spirituality back in the human body to kind of rehumanize and create an internal locus of control. That could be the new binding agent where those who are not overly invested in, in prior dogma, but who can use the lessons extracted from our very recent 10 year journey in, you know, in the, the major kind of technological investigations, forays into uh, top down social media use, all of that. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we've extracted so many lessons from the past decade. Yeah, it's, it's that so it feels, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's trying to really reconcile. It's not just about young people. I think, I think you know, it's the fact that you've got lots of young people who are going to be discontent is the kind of energy which needs to be challenged, channeled to uh, create events. But really, um, obviously, this kind of thing has to include old people, really, older people of uh, old generations. And the way to do that is to appeal to the kind of more traditional aspects and appeal to existing culture. Um, yeah. Uh, I think you know it's the singularity chase. I think you know Elon Musk and uh, you know Larry Page, according to Peter Field, have lost interest. But the the, yes. the idea that you can create you know like a you know industry 4.0 that you can really create a world of plenty. Now, interesting. I was reading uh, kind of John Maynard Keynes essays recently, The Economist, and he was looking for a kind of like ethical moral economics. You know, mm -hmm. so you know we we think we're, this is these are new issues of looking you know like new age thinkers looking for an you know, ethical uh, way of doing economics. But John Maynard Keynes addressed this issue when, in his youth. He has actually you know, understood Nietzsche, understood the, the loss of these values. And he, he understood economics wasn't just about you know, utilitarianism and, and people weren't just yes. numbers. And he was looking for this uh, moral, uh, he, he called it a, a kind of revolution in a, a kind of the ethics and morality of capitalism. And that's what his original goal. He didn't completely fail. He thought he failed later on. And go, you know, but we have Keynesian economics, which strives to avoid mass unemployment. That's, that's not one good thing that came out of his work. But, but, but anyway, I mean, uh, you, know, you know, these, these, these uh, people were kind of like, you know, in their own way, these establishment people were trying to take this ethical, you know, kind of like ideas which are really lost now. They were trying to implement, it, implement it in their own way. So I think what the point is basically members of the establishment and also people like Keynes, and even like Freemasons, even aristocracy, even even mm -hmm. you know your 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 kind of like rulers and stuff, and especially your tech elites. Now I talked rather disdainfully about the kind of tech idolatry earlier on, didn't I? About the yeah. kind of making idols. But I, th I think I think people like Musk and Zuckerberg, they're reaching out. You know, even like people yeah. like you know for years I abhorred stuff Sam Harris was saying about Islam, total crap. I was, you know, many much of uh, Jordan Peterson stuff I, I can't stand. 
but the fact that they're all reaching out for the same truth and the same That's truth it. can be you know also be uh communicated not just to young people they'll be very receptive but even to your establishment you know and, and then loads of freemasons and they they write to me they write to me they, they uh, as in <laughs> they they're exposed the idea from even reading a dan brown novel and they, they're, they're inquiring <laughs> about their own history you know really well, one young freemason in, in new zealand actually said half, he was half jesting but it's half being serious is are you a master yeah. freemason <laughs> ah. said, no, I said, no, no. But anyway, it just goes to show that, you know, even these, uh, you know, old establishment uh, kind of organizations, they're, they're reaching out for something better. You know what I'm saying? And they're, they're quite powerful in, 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 here in London in the police and the judiciary. Mm. So I think it's not just young people with this message. You really can reach even aristocrats. You can reach the establishment for a revolution to be truly successful. It can't be just young people and not even just, you know, overeducated, you know, elite young people. You have to get the establishment on your side, I think. So that's, that's one point. Always. The, the second point uh, I think you raised about the tech uh, singularity thing is that uh, at the end of the day, I think that the solution to what's happening on this planet has to be, has to have a technological dimension to it. It does. So, so but without can... the delusion and the false expectation of a top-down savior mode, and it's, it's, it's actually going to upend, and again, going back to the difference between the external locus of control versus the internal locus of control, which is more bottom up generated idealism that speaks with the the you know the the structural establishment in order to ne negotiate somewhere you know in, yeah, in yeah. the middle I, I it's feeling that, like uh, the, the, the bottom-up aspect really is the the power of the secret revolution and that basically the bottom-up aspect can really be once you communicate these ideas into the, the mainstream into you know all these different groups that Correct. is your secret revolution, which absolutely is grassroots, because it's about the individual. It's about individuals yeah. taking all these ideas, going, my God, this is something, you know, yeah. inspiring. I mean, Hegel wrote that, you know, when you have inspiring visions of the future, it shakes people out of there. He wrote the indolence. There's a kind of sluggishness, sluggishness mm -hmm. that Karl Marx wrote about, that these ideas can inspire people to action. That, that's your grassroots, and that's through worldview. Now, in terms of top down, I think there is a, there's an opportunity you know the, the the talk I did in in, in March. I think I, you, you you attended. Sorry, not March in uh, in July. Uh -huh. to the fact that the revolution in the, the Enlightenment revolution wasn't just grassroots. It wasn't just you know like Freemasons uh, taking on the king. In a, in a sense, we, we talked about Frederick Frederick the Great was a Freemason. He's called an enlightened ruler. In a sense, mm -hmm. he implemented those ideas of equality, liberty, fraternity during his kingdom, during his kingship. So, yeah. so I think I think it's I think it's not just bottom up. I think it can be bottom up and top down. And if Always. we can actually get people like Mark Zuckerberg, these this billionaire class on side, that's so so much the better. I'd I'd say. Mm. My so way, and, 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 and another observation is that I think what touches me the most about your personal work and your personal journey is is that you you are weaving between the left and right brain experience of, of the domain. Also, um, I, and I always think in terms of hooks that, that pull people in, if we look at the disembodiment um, of the, and the alienation of the average human from their physicality, which is the seat of their spirituality, it feels like what, what your particular approach brings is a delight in the minutiae of, of the body and how it manifests both from micro to macro, but also how body emulates um, spiritual egregore as well. I don't know whether that makes sense. So yeah, there's yeah, something, yeah. This, there's something uh, the, the hook for me for the younger generations would be from a STEM innovation e excitement of, and that, that um, quest for learning, the, the creative instinct, um, which you say, uh, you know, has an evolutionary foundation. Yeah, it just... Yeah feels like your lens is what I am so at attracted to bec because it locates the, div the divinity and the magic, uh, the, design, the, the design magic. Um, it locates it in the human body, which makes it a palpable, re-embodied experience. I, I just think there's, there's something so powerful about being able to lo locate um, 
a, a trapdoor into divinity, but rooting it through your body, which, as Jamie Wheel says, is you know the quest for ecstasis, um, for communitas, for yeah, 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 the yeah. the individual to then yeah. relocate itself back in the group dynamic, but first coming through the individual, then. Um, uh, fleshing out to a, a group identification, a, a, a larger identification. For me personally, that, yeah, yeah. that lens that you have is so special and it feels like it's magic enough for um, the unjaded, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is why I'm focusing on the younger vector, you know, the, the, the bulk, the 42% who are going to take over. You know, I mean, um, again, I, 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 yeah, like uh, this seems to bring down the tone of the talk, but I'll tell you a simple truth about revolutionary movements and system change and, uh, and about youth. I, I, think, I think basically uh, what it is, is basically these revolutionary movements happen because it's youth needing to carve out their space to essentially yes. have families to continue the life cycle. Yes. So in the earlier diagrams, there's a simple family life cycle of having kids and setting up home. And this idea of basically, what's what you're trying to do? You're create, trying to create the conditions whereby you're gonna prosper and have kids. Now, uh, young people are not necessarily thinking about this. What they're thinking about is reproduction. Not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but these revolutions are really driven by sexual energy. That's what it is. That's a simple fact. I mean, I yeah. think it's, it's really uh, young people are often not interested in, you know, philo philosophy or kind of, um, you know, reinstating the Renaissance or whatever. But there's a kind of instinctual desire to, to reproduce. And part mm -hmm. of that programming is carving out a space, making a living for yourself in society whereby you can raise kids but if your planet is dying and your society is, is you know hopeless and you can't find work and you know it's falling apart do you know what i'm saying then that instinct to create space uh, you know a, a field of your own a farmstead to raise children then basically that energy is what is driving these revolutions either consciously Absolutely. or subconsciously and Absolutely. in terms of yeah in terms of vector it, it, it's it ultimately ideas really transmit. So in terms of, uh, you know, propagating and instigating this secret revolution, we talked about mm. Gutenberg, we talked about internet. At the end of the day, you've got to articulate these ideas and ultimately, you know, social movements really come about through the articulation and the spread of ideas and hence the mm. secret revolution. And it's going to be, it's going to be the, the new pan-sophism, the new Bildung, but it has to be exciting and has to be epic. It has to be a, a reason for it. it. Has to be something, you know, the vision that grips the masses, all these left-wing thinkers we were talking about earlier. It has to be that and it has to be utopian. It has to be absolutely kind of like, you know, not just utopia has to be not just good or it's going to be sort of all right. It's going to be wonder bar. It's going to be great. That's what we're going to express. <laughs> you know, really. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the thing to, 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 to communicate, I think. And, and I think, I think ultimately, you know, social movements is about, uh, you know, is about people ultimately is, you know, people getting yeah. social movements because they want to, they're lonely. They want to be a part of a crowd. They want to be, have a sense of identity, basically. If you create a kind of identity that's revolutionary, but also brings people together, you know, not just young people or old people, but all different kinds of people, Muslims, you know, Chinese, you know, or, or mm -hmm. at least reconcile division. That, that's something I think the you know is, is what's needed really for anything else to happen. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I so kind of ask the uh, any other questions. Thank American, you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's a very uh, insightful um, and also interesting points raised. Any other questions? I wonder. Uh, why I, I'm I've just joined okay, your so conversations uh, relatively recently, and I'm definitely going to go back and look at some of your further previous uh, discussions, uh, but uh, what, is, uh, what is your opinion on the, the transhumanist movement as a nucleus for reaching you know, global communities? Well, well, I, well, I think, I think um, you know, humanism began with this, uh, you know, kind of like religious aspect, you know, oration on the dignity of man, you know, the, the manifesto of Renaissance humanism was essentially, uh, it's all about the fact that you're God, you know, um, Pico de Mirandola, this is the manifesto of the Renaissance, she actually says, you know, uh, quotes Psalm 82.6, that, that uh, you know, you're all gods. And uh, the idea of being union with God being the ultimate aim of the, the, the magus, uh, that, so that's the manifesto of the Renaissance. Transhumanism has become something different. It's becoming godlike in using, uh, you know, technology, using life extension, using maybe later, you know, kind of like 
artificial prosthetics. Now, there is a movement in, uh, in, in Mormonism, Lincoln Cannon, uh, who is uh, on my Facebook, I don't really know the guy. I mean, it's, he's, he's basically, he's a Mormon. Mormonism is basically uh, Freemasonry for the masses. That's what it is. Joseph Smith was a Freemason. All the Salt Lake Temple ceremonies is adapted Freemasonry. Anyway, the, the, you know, it, it, it's a heavily mystical content in Freemasonry. Uh, the sixth uh, president, Lorenzo Snow, the famous quote, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. So there is a kind of mystical transhumanism, which some of these kind of Freemason groups are pursuing. Now, what I'd say is basically, yes, um, transhumanism is great to be godlike, like this is like, you know, Yuval Noah Harari. But I think we can Last give them year. something better. We can give them basically transhumanism. You know, I've got some friends in Humanism Plus, but transhumanism plus plus with the, with the mysticism returned. You know, like the, the Volk Bildung is almost like the Volk Bildung, it's like the fake Bildung. It's like, it's like you know, it's, it's the, the ultimate aim of, you know, kind of like uh, shaping oneself in the image of God taken away to become this adult education, uh, you know, continuous education program with a bit of social responsibility and a bit of political activism. And it's like, you know, the Christian Eucharist is basically psychedelic Eleusian mysteries with the placebo is the actual drugs taken out. It's Coca-Cola without the cocaine. So I think transhumanism as, as, as it is today, is basically is kind of watered down version of the real thing. It, it, so it's like a kind of idolatry. It's really finding God in the person. Whereas in the Renaissance, they were really about transcendence. They were about spiritual transcendence. They were really about, you know, basically this idea of union with God. So I think, I think all these, uh, you know, earlier tech movements uh, like um, transhumanism are basically reaching out for something and you, basically everything in transhumanism is good, life extension, you know, kind of prosthetics and all that kind of stuff, but you can, you can give that extra dimension, I think. Thank you. So, so that, that is, yes, uh, sorry, your question, could that be a basis for uh, future movements? Yes, it can. And the, the, the aim then is to basically try and integrate all these separate movements, trans, transhumanism, tech movements, uh, you know, Freemasonry, all these existing movements. There's, there's some kind of common narrative, I suppose, and get them to find common cause. So any other questions? And uh, any other questions? Okay, that was a, uh, any other questions or else? Amazing discussion. Yeah, okay, we've gone on for a bit longer than anticipated, but I mean, it's a uh, great, great, amazing, amazing crowd, amazing revolutionary, evolutionary, uh, meditating, speculating, theorizing a bunch of people. Okay, thanks Q for joining me and, uh, you know, uh, subscribe, uh, connect with me, donate, patronize me, stay connected because there's loads more information coming out. So, okay, thank you for joining me. Okay, goodbye. Yes. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll, I'll stop recording now. Okay, stop recording now. Okay, end. Oh, no. Okay, so, so basically I'll stop recording. Okay, I'll stop recording. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you for attending. Okay, thank you for attending. I shall have a little drink and then I shall have a, something to eat. Amazing, amazing audience. My God, amazing. Uh, what a talented bunch of people. My God, I'm amazing. Uh, I can see, I can see uh, the names on the list in the amazing. I mean, I mean, it's always quality, not quantity. Really amazing collection of really smart, People, I'm mean, amazing. I'm, I'm blessed. I feel privileged to, you know, be in the same Zoom meeting with you guys. Well, thank you for all your hard work. I can see so much effort has been put into putting together a comprehensive presentation. I appreciate that. Oh, thanks. No, and stay in touch because there's loads more to come. I mean, there's tons. There's an entire world view to come. Oh, yeah. And the, you know, what, what is it's a social movement at the start at the end of time, but it's also a startup. So we're going to create software and machine learning stuff. So. So loads more to come in the future. Thanks, Wayne. Speak soon. Okay. okay, everyone keep in touch. You know, connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, and uh, basically keep in touch. And we will see you again, hopefully soon. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, end meeting for all. Oh, no, save the, uh, save the text. Sorry, save the chat so I can read it later on. Oh, how do I save the damn chat? How was we'll save the chat? Oh, save chat. Here we go. Save chat. Chat saved. I can end the meeting for all. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Okay. Ending the meeting now. Ending the meeting. In meeting for all.